12 o'clock on your Tuesday afternoon now. Welcome in. It is the halftime show. Tyler Head along with you. Uh, I've been told Terry Ford is in the building. He, uh, of course, was out yesterday, uh, flew solo for at least the first two hours, but he is supposed to be here. I think I hear him coming in now, so uh, he'll be joining me in just a second. Plenty to get to over the course of the next couple hours, but we'll start off with the news of the day that dropped around 5 o'clock last night, uh, that being that Michi Johnson has elected to enter the transfer portal and forego playing his final year of college eligibility here at South Carolina. Um, you know, we, we knew going into this offseason we are going to be losing Talon Cooper, going to be losing B.J. Mack, Stephen Clark as well. Um, you know, three guys that came in and played very important roles on the team this year, and we kind of penciled in Michi Johnson as one of the prime guys for next season that you really build your team around, and uh, unfortunately, he's not going to be around uh, for that next season. We don't know where he's going to go. There's heavy rumors and speculation about him going to Ohio State, which would make a lot of sense. That is, of course, where he started his college career. Uh, primarily was a bench player uh, before transferring to South Carolina, where he's turned in to one of the key pieces on this team so he'd be returning as a much better version of himself than he left Ohio State um, in addition to just being from the Ohio area and uh, getting to play in front of friends and friends and family in addition to of course anytime somebody goes in the transfer portal NIL always comes in the conversation and that certainly uh, would be playing a piece uh, as well we don't know how big of a piece but certainly would be there as um, Ohio State as we know does have a pretty good NIL program uh, going on up there but regardless Michi Johnson not gonna be around for next season and uh, um, you know, somebody that um, you hate to see go. I mean, look, he was part. See, first of all, and it's natural when you've had a a run the way South Carolina did. By the way, how you doing? Good to meet you. <laughs> yeah, nice to be um, back. When you've had a historic run like South Carolina did, and so the guy, the people that play on that team will always have this like special place in your heart as a fan. Sure, because you came out of nowhere. You went from. You know, preseason number 14 to competing to win the, the regular season championship. You won a game in the SEC tournament. You, won, you went to the NCAAs and no one saw it coming. So this crew is always going to, in this fan base, have a special place. Anytime you've been a fan and your favorite team, quote unquote, shocked the world and came out of nowhere to do something special, it's kind of there, right? Sure. And you look at those players in a different way like the south carolina women's team you, you don't have that special place in your heart like that because they're just demolishing people they're number one in the country they're undefeated number one seed they're special in a different reason because right. they're so good and when they if they if they cut down the nets and win a title obviously they have yeah, a place you're, right you're just adding this roster to the long list of already right. very accomplished women's basketball and, players and that's not that's not pushing it aside it's just different sure right sure it's a different level but what those guys did this year coming out of nowhere the way they did and you know with a special win at tennessee the one against kentucky here you know the other w's i like got a and m w when zach davis hits the hoop to win the game at almost triple zero I mean, I know you lost the game, but playing for the SEC regular season crown in the CLA mm -hmm. against Tennessee, like an all-time atmosphere for men's basketball here. Right, and th 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 that those moments are going to stick with you as a fan. Now, I say that because, look, Demetri Johnson get better from year one to year two? Yes. Yes. He did. His floor game was much better. Um, he his was shot smarter. selection got better. He was a lot smarter with the shots that yes. he took. Yes. I mean, it felt like he grew his basketball IQ all the way around. Will that be missed? Sure, it will be. And the fact he was part of last year will be missed. But let's let's be real about one thing. You can replace the offensive production of Michi Johnson. Yes. He's a very streaky offensive player. There'll be games Michi go for 25, and there'll be a game Michi goes for five. Yeah. So... It Let's everybody breathe a second. Let me do. I mean, I'm not telling you what to do, but I would advise to breathe for a second and say yeah. this. Yes, losing Michi, he was part of last year, and it means something to, to us as a fan. And you know, we'll miss you know how much he got better, how much he improved, and some of these other little intangible things he did. But offensively, very streaky player. To be fair, 
very streaky. Now you are losing out on what could potentially be an improved third year here at South Carolina. Possibly. Okay, he made a big step from year one to year two. Let's see what he could do from year mm-hmm. two to year three. Not to say that he couldn't still be streaky, but maybe it's a little bit more, I don't say marginalized, but a little bit more consistent in year number three if he were to stick around. And that's always a possibility or the possibility this is the best version of him we don't know. True. We'll see next year. To me, it's interesting. And again, you want to go back, play in your home state, in front of your family. That's great. I, go, go get them, right? Good for you. Do whatever you want to do. If you get a great NIL deal, too, all right, that's fine, too. That's the, the world we live in. Sure. And it's always ironic to me that people go nuts over these players for lack of loyalty, but it's okay for coaches and ADs and teams and conferences and everybody else not to have any loyalty. But you ask the players, the the, the youngest group of everyone, yes. we want you to be the most mature and be the most loyal. Uh, and Wes, Chris, and I were talking about this in the last hour, and this gets brought up a lot when we talk about guys transferring out. It gets brought up a lot when we talk about the likes of Spencer Rattler saying, okay, well, when, when these guys have families down the road and they want to come back to a school for a homecoming or something like that, what school are they going to go to? Would they be accepted at South Carolina? How much does that actually mean to guys at the yeah. end of the day? Like, is that as important of a thing as we, we would like to present it as? I don't know if it is. I think it's more important to a fan. I, I just do. I think fans... It, because, look, you grow up on these players like me. My generation, you know, college basketball players typically were staying four years. If they left early, they left one year early to go to the NBA well, draft. And there's a whole lot left spots in the NBA than there are in the NFL. So Right. I mean, and, and then you would see, like, when Isaiah Thomas, when I was a kid, Isaiah Thomas left after his sophomore year. Oh, my God. Magic Johnson left after his freshman year at Michigan. Or sophomore. I'm trying to remember. I think maybe sophomore year at Michigan State. It was like, oh, my God. Yeah. You didn't stay three years? Sure. So then things like this nomadic world is different to a lot of fans. And they're having a tough time with it. And also, let's be honest. It's also a thing of, hey, you're a college kid. Shut up and do what you're told. How dare you have power? How dare you have choices? How dare you want to make money? You have a, you get a scholarship, dude. That scholarship is quite valuable. Hey, I'm a parent of a girl in college. I know how valuable a scholarship would be. Right. My pocketbook knows how valuable a scholarship would be. So I get all the thinking that we're used to seeing, but that's gone, man. you got to understand. Now, did this thing go way too far to one side to way too far to another side? Yeah, you can say that, and I won't disagree with it. But you have to understand, it's different now. And, again, these kids have learned from all the grown-ups around them to get yours, man. Go get yours. Because everybody's getting theirs. I mean, you've got Stanford in the ACC, for the love of God. You know, I mean, that's ridiculous. Everybody goes and gets theirs. You tell Coaches. me the, the Atlantic Ocean's not the closest ocean to them? Well, they decided to move it. I don't know if you knew that. They're going to pick up the Atlanta, the entire Atlantic coast and move I, it I close mean, to Stanford. I mean, technically, the oceans touch off the tip of South America, so it's practically the same, right? Splitting hairs, right? Right. Splitting hairs. Or I guess so the Panama it, Canal. Again, it's just the, it's just the idea... That it's, you know, we want this to be the way it was. Sure. But we found out that was breaking all sorts of what kind of laws? Antitrust. Antitrust. Oh, of the Sherman Act of 1890. And we know all about that here now. Uh, I know um, I know too much about that. <laughs> so it's just, it's just the idea that this is the world we're in now. And these kids see everyone around them going for theirs. Coaches. You know, you know again, Caleb DeBoer was at Washington for two years. I'm sure he didn't walk into living rooms and say, you know, I plan to be at Washington probably about two years until a better gig comes up. Sure. You think he said that? Uh, probably not. I, no. If he did, that kid did not commit to the Huskies. Exactly. I mean, look, I, look, I understand what Nick Saban's saying to a point, but when you're talking about all these kids care about some money and you're pulling how many millions a year as a head coach? I mean, again, I understand why people it, get upset about all this stuff, but it, at the end of the day, Everything is just, look, Well, it was against the law for it, it, it decades. Was. And there is a acclimation period. We mm-hmm. are still so, we're not even three years into NIL being a thing. So you're going to have to talk you know, 
eight, 10, 12 years into this thing before it just becomes truly normalized mm-hmm. where we're not saying, well, it, it used to be this way or why, why is it like this? Like it's going to take a lot more time to really kind of settle in and accept this as a true normal college sports. And who knows what it's going to look like at that point in time because it continues to change each and every day, it feels like, but, but still so young into this when we look at a guy like Michi Johnson going into the transfer portal, we ask the question, well, why would they do that? And why, you know, doesn't he have loyalty to South Carolina? Well, at the end of the day, not really. Well, guess I mean, what? You know how he got here? How did he get to South Carolina? Sure, there was some NIL involved in that as and, well. And how did he show up? Transfer portal. Yeah. And, uh, again, he enjoyed his time here. Talked mm-hmm. about that on his Instagram Live thing last night. And, you know, put in a good word for Coach Paris and for any other uh, transfers that may be looking in here. But other than that, I mean, he doesn't have any loyalty to the University of South no. Carolina and, and doesn't necessarily need to. And here's the other part of this. After the season South Carolina just had, you don't you think there's gonna be um, ball players that want to come play for Lamont Paris? Again, this is what it's about now, and I know it drives a lot of fans crazy. Um, there are programs that poach your guys; you go poach other programs' guys. It's the way it is. Until there is <clears throat> a collective, a collectively bargained agreement between all parties to set rules. So we don't see everything end up in court. This is what you're going to continue to get. It is the wild, wild west. In the wild, wild west, you've seen the westerns. You know, sometimes you sometimes you win the gunfight. Sometimes you don't. That's what it is now. It's like a western you watch when you were a kid. There are no rules. There are no regulations. And you try to set rules and regulations, they just get wiped out in court because again, you're breaking antitrust laws. And that's what everybody uses now, man. It's like this, ready? Everything you remember, remember the collectives. Guess what? Collectives do what they want now. Because well, they got wiped it, out in court, correct? The it, NCAA it, tried to set up something, would it come back? You it, are breaking antitrust laws by limiting opportunities to uh, push yourself forward in and, revenue generation. And, and Michi Johnson specifically said, hey, I haven't talked to anybody. Nobody's reached out to me or anything like mm-hmm. that. Even if Ohio State did, if they're collective and they, like, quote, tweeted something mm-hmm. about him last night implying they were they were already involved, even if their collective did reach out and said, hey, one can play for us, here's X amount of dollars, there's nothing illegal about that. No, now. not at all. Nothing. And that's the other part. There, it's nothing illegal if South Carolina reaches out to a player yeah, somewhere. It, it's all on the table. It's all fair game. Everything is wide open. And until there's a collective bargaining agreement. Right. This is what you're going to have. And you like it when you get players and it stinks when you lose players because that's human well, nature too. It's and, okay. And in the early days of the transfer portal, I think there was a lot of, I don't know if cynicism is the right word, but everybody is, uh, specifically skews to negative. As soon as somebody transfers out, oh, I wasn't that great of a player anyway. Ah, oh, we don't need him. Ah, blah, 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 blah. Where I think now it's become such a normal thing. You still have a few of those people out there that like can't believe he would do this, and uh, you know I mm-hmm. I'm not I hate him forever now and all that kind of stuff. But it's just become such a more normalized part of the game. It's like yeah, it happens. And it does happen and again. You know, I think it's it's a bigger shot when it's someone from your home state who played high school sports in your home state and came to the home state university, and all of a sudden they transfer out. That one stings a little bit more, especially if. You're a state that lives and dies on your state university's athletic program, or a lot of people do. Um, but Michi Johnson was an Ohio kid. Came here for an opportunity because he couldn't get off the bench at Ohio State and get minutes. Came here, got his opportunity. To his credit, took advantage of his opportunity pretty well. Improved in two years. And now he's going to, if everything we hear is true, he'll go back to Ohio State with a better chance if not starting, getting legitimate minutes as, you know, maybe the first guard off the bench. Right. I will say this about Michi is that he had a really good setup here. Really good setup here. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and we'll get into that in the next segment. We'll talk about that. As we discuss Michi Johnson, we'll talk to you as well at 803-404-6100 phone line or text line. It's a halftime show. Terry Ford and Tyler Head, we're rolling up until 3. No, we're up until 1230. And we have Shane Beamer coming up with his presser during spring uh, practice. That's coming up uh, in 15 minutes on the game.
All right, halftime show. Terry Ford, Tyler Head, up until 12.30. Then Shane Beamer will take over with uh, Shane's uh, presser from uh, spring practice. That's coming up. Real quick about Michi. The thing about Michi Johnson is if he doesn't end up at Ohio State, again, who knows how, what, how their roster makeup's going to be, right? Sure. You got a new coach who was the interim coach. Who was uh, there when Michi was there prior right. to the assistant. You don't know what kind of turnover you're going to have on the roster. Sure. So there's a big unknown there. So could Michi have a lot of opportunity? Sure he could. But at South Carolina, you know, Michi led the team in shots taken. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's going to happen in, in, in other places Michi goes to. Right. So my point is Michi had a nice setup here. Now, should Michi be your number one option on offense? If I'm being fair, no. He's just too streaky. He's too hit and miss. I mean, like I said, he can score 25 one day and score five the next day. You want well, someone more consistent to be your number one option on offense. And I think that's what worked so well for this team, that there was never truly definitive one number one guy, that some days it was Michi, some days it was VJ Max, some days it was Kyle Murray Boyles. Like, it just kind of depended on the night on who really stepped up and was the leader of the offense. Now, is that the best way to build your team every single year? No, it's not, but it worked for them at least this year. I think it worked for them a lot of times, but in the, in the times where they went five, six, seven minutes without scoring, it would be nice to have a bucket maker. Sure. A guy that could, like, you know, Tennessee had one in yep. Connect. A guy that says, okay, we've missed seven straight, straight shots. Do me a favor. Just get me the rock in a good spot, and I'll get us back on the board. Yeah. And so, I mean, Michi, look, Michi is – if you take it all together in totality, he shot 40% from the floor, 32% from three. Those are below average numbers. Yeah. But there were games Michi was phenomenal offensively. Just very streaky player. He In, in a perfect world, he's like your number three, four option on offense. Mm -hmm. That way on the nights he's not scoring, you got dudes who can score, right? Right. So Michi had a nice setup here where he was really asked to take a, you know, to take a lot of shots. I don't know if he's going to get that same opportunity if he shows up at Ohio State. And, you know, and they rebuild their team. Could he start at the two? Sure he could. But is he going to lead the team in shots taken? Most likely not. So he had a really yeah. nice setup here. He, he did. He really did. Yeah. And I get why he wants to go. I understand yeah. it. But I don't know if you're going to replicate what you had here somewhere else in regard yeah. to your role in the offense. That's and, what I'm saying. And I know he, the main thing is him going in the transfer portal. He says he's also going to throw his name out there and see what, you know, his NBA – prospects are, are going to be and if he has a shot there and probably not at this point in time because right. I don't think he's shown enough um, you know to be to be somebody that's going to be drafted or anything like that and, and again going to Ohio State if you do end up you know um, you know being an integral part of their offense are you going to be able to show enough in the, in the year there mm -hmm. to, to raise your draft stock I, I don't know that's the question yeah I mean right now if you ask me about drafts he's not a draft he wouldn't get drafted I mean, does he have athleticism and quicks? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But the, the other parts of his game just aren't consistent enough. Like, at that size, you got to be able to have some kind of, like, something to your game. Sure. Like, he's not mm. a point guard. And, and he's not consistent mm. from three. Mm. And there's other things that just aren't consistent enough. Now, does he have physical ability? Like, athleticism? Oh, absolutely. Sure. But the other parts well, of his game would have to get tightened it, up. I, I guess if you have a LeBron advocating to you, that might help out a little bit, too. Yeah. Uh, he knows them. They they know people. They know each other. I right, just grab a call real quick. Let's get Lee, uh, who's in holding eight zero three four four sixty one hundred. Lee, thanks for hanging. You're on. Uh, you're on the halftime show in the game. What's up? Hey guys, how y'all doing? Today? Doing all right, good. man. Yeah, but you hanging in there, okay? I'm doing good, man. Doing real good. Um, reason that college uh, women's college basketball has gotten so much popular is because you know who the players are going to be next year. And a lot of popularity in college, men's college basketball kind of faded for me, especially because you don't know who's going to be on the team next year. And it's, 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 it's kind of hard to, you know, a lot of times we follow the players and you sell jerseys because the guy's on the team and, you, and that kind of thing. And just kind of, I'm an old school fan, I, I, like you was talking about earlier. You know, I know this is the world we live in, but it doesn't mean I have to like it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Lee, I, you and I grew up kind of like the same way, and I appreciate it. We got to get to Shane Beamer, Lee. Thanks. Uh, we got to get to Shane's presser. Yeah, when you're used to dudes being on the team three and four years, and now it's so nomadic, and you don't know who, the jersey to buy yeah. and who's yeah. going to be on the team from year to year, when you got used to one way, sure. there's a well, new one. And I think Lee said it right that, you know, I can – Accept it. I just yeah. don't have to like it. Yeah, and look, I'm from a different generation than you guys, but I grew up with guys sticking around 
three and four years and only recently has this become a, a new thing so um you know i've accepted it as a part of college sports but it doesn't mean like yeah this is my favorite thing in the world either so i think we're all kind of in the same accord here but we have to accept it as a part of the game if you want to continue to enjoy it yeah we all like that connection that two three four years brings yeah. that you're not getting now because everybody's all over the place yeah all right shane beamer Presser with uh, Coach at spring practice coming up next, halftime show here on the game in Columbia. Also, you'll be hearing it on the game in Myrtle Beach as well.
All right, it's time to hear from South Carolina football coach Shane Beamer um, after another spring practice session. Here is uh, the coach here on the game in Good Columbia and Myrtle Beach. Everyone. Uh, again today. First of all, before I start, just wanted to uh, send our prayers to everyone up in Maryland affected by that uh, bridge collapse. What an awful situation and tragedy. As you guys know, we have a lot of players on our team from that area, D.C., Northern Virginia, Maryland, uh, Delaware as well that are in that region. So as of 730 this morning in our team meeting, don't think anybody was uh, directly affected by that, but certainly uh, hits close to home for all those guys being from that area and um, um, thinking of everyone up there. Uh, I want to thank all the high school coaches that were here last weekend for our high school coaches clinic. Had an awesome uh, two days. Appreciate Scott Abel, the head football coach at Davidson. Uh, college for uh, coming down and speaking on Friday morning. Uh, what an amazing night on Friday night with uh, Houston Nutt and Mark Rick. They were beyond uh, exceptional. And uh, I know our coaches, myself, and, and all the high school coaches really appreciated them. And then Gus Bradley, the defensive coordinator of the Indianapolis Colts, and someone that I have a lot of admiration for going back to his time as the defensive coordinator with the Seahawks and then head coach of the Jaguars did an awesome job on Saturday morning as well. So really enjoyed visiting with all the visiting college and pro coaches and then all the high school coaches that came out as well. Some great fellowship with them. Want to wish Coach Staley good luck this weekend up in uh, Albany. Got a chance to get over there on Sunday and holy smokes uh, watching them play on Sunday. So hopefully they can keep that um, uh, level of uh, uh, consistency up and continue to get better. But but we'll be pulling for them this weekend also. Been a good first week for us. Just finished practice four. Saturday was our first day in full pads. Uh, today was our first day back since Saturday. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of energy, a lot of excitement out there, a lot of new faces. Uh, whether it be transfers, freshmen, uh, so a lot of newness, but really, really excited about those new guys, along with uh, so many of the returning players that have played a lot of football here, uh, Luke Doty and Vershawn Lee and Ja'Kai Moore and and Boogie Huntley and Tonka Hemingway and Debo. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, lot of guys that have been here for a long time as well that are back. So really, really a uh, good start. Got a lot of work to do, obviously. Uh, practice today, like I said, uh, we'll meet, lift, have our normal day off, our day between practice schedule tomorrow. We'll practice on Thursday, and then our guys will have the weekend off for Easter. So we'll finish up on Thursday, and then those guys will be able to uh, get away for Easter if they want to, and then we'll be right back at it next week for week three. So I'm pleased with where we are right now and a lot of work to do, but continuing to try and get better. Questions? Shane, any more additions, subtractions from the injury list? I know that Hughes and Swigert might have missed a couple of days last week. Yeah, they were, they've were. they been out. Um, uh, also, you might have, we might have to catch you up from your press conference you missed last week when you were traveling to Pittsburgh as well. I think I hit those guys. If I didn't, I apologize. But those guys will be out. Uh, haven't, they haven't gotten back yet. Like I said, hopeful that they still will. Uh, really, the only new addition, David, would be uh, Juju McDowell. He'll probably, not probably, he will be done um, for the spring. It's nothing. Um, long term it was something a collarbone that's been bothering him a little bit that he fell on not in a contact drill but diving for a ball to catch a pass and uh, kind of came down on the wrong way and it was a situation where we said do we want to continue to have this thing nag him and, and be an issue or do we want to go ahead and, and get it fixed and we he and all of us agreed let's just go ahead and get it fixed where it's not an issue going forward so he will uh um, he'll have a procedure done to get that mended up, and uh, he's not excited about it, but that's what he wants to do, and uh, he'll be good to go uh, here shortly. Won't be able to do anything else the rest of practice, but uh, he's a guy. He's played a lot of football around here, and we, uh, we know what he can do. Shane, I know it's early, and a lot of people will be interested about the quarterback position, not saying there's a, not competition at other positions, but being able to have a guy like Robbie with the experience that he has along with, obviously, with what Sellers got to experience last year, and I know there's some other quarterbacks in there. What have you noticed just through the 
first couple practices, especially with growth with sellers and just maybe just trying to add that experience to the portal this offseason? Yeah, I think, first of all, there's just great competition uh, in that room because you've got a bunch of guys that are all competing and uh, they all believe they can be and should be the quarterback here at South Carolina. So there's great competition, first of all, which I love. And then I think there's just a uh, there's an experience and a maturity aspect with those guys. Uh, you know, we may have a lot of new faces around here, not just in the quarterback room, but all across the board. We may had a lot. We may have lost a lot of production here at Carolina, but we replaced it with a lot of production from other schools. Now they may not have had that production um, uh, here at Carolina, but those receivers that we've brought in, like Jared and Gage and Amari, like they taught, they caught a bunch of balls at the college they're coming from, and DeAndre Jules had a lot of production and Jawarn Howe and Oscar Attaway, they had Rocket Sanders. Yeah, we lost some production, but we've replaced it with a lot of production as well. And I say that because it's the same situation in the in the quarterback room as well. Those guys have have played at this level. Robbie has started games in this conference. Uh, now that Oklahoma and Texas are in the SEC, uh, Davis Bevel has started a game, an SEC team now versus an SEC team now. Uh, and when you play quarterback in that OU Texas game, that game is wowzers when you talk about just electricity and intensity. So uh, they're not like freshmen out of high school. It's new for them because they're learning a new system and how we do things and things like that. But it's not a situation where you know, the bullets are flying out there and, and they don't know how to respond. They've been in those situations before, which is great. And then that helps Lenoris as well, just having those guys to compete with him. And, and Lenoris, uh, I'm really pleased with the progress he's made because there is no, you know, Spencer in that room anymore. There's Luke, who obviously has played a lot of football and somebody he can lean on, but, you know, he can't rely on Spencer. And, and Lenoris really since January, Mike, has been great just as far as taking a leadership role vocally and, and continuing to uh, try and do the things that you need your quarterback to do. Shane, some of the guys, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Shane, some of the guys in here yesterday were kind of talking about, you know, what to expect from the offense, and you guys are going to try to be explosive, have some more downhill runs and stuff. Just want to get your take on what fans and people can expect uh, from the offense from your perspective. Yeah, that's one thing that uh, we count explosive plays as a run over 12 yards and a pass over 18 yards. And same thing on defensively, if you – are giving up 12 yard runs and 18 yard passes or more that's giving up explosives and and you know if you look at our record the way that we keep it I think we're something like 16 and 2 in our 3 years here if we just win the explosive play battle each week and that's not rocket science. Every team in America probably is doing the same thing. If you have a lot of big plays, your chances of winning are going to go up. But it's something that we've emphasized, always have, and uh, really have emphasized to our players about being explosive offensively and then not giving up explosives defensively, which we did too many times at, at times last year. Um, so, yeah, we want to be explosive. But as always, it's it's – we want to be balanced. Well, what does that mean? It's, to me, it's not 50-50. It's the ability to run the ball when you need to run it and the ability to throw it when you need to throw it. Um, protecting the football. We were better last year at uh, protecting the football offensively, but still not where we you know, want to be. We were dead last. My first two years here, we, we were better, a lot better last season. But we certainly can continue to improve that. And then beyond that, it just gets into uh, let's figure out who our best players are and figure out how we're going to get them on the field and, and get on the ball. And uh, we're, we're deeper at running back. Yes, we lost a lot of production at, uh, at wide receiver with Zay being gone, but we, we, we have more depth in that room. I think we have more depth in the tight end room. So it's, eager, it's, it's exciting to watch those guys get out there and compete. And let's figure out you know, who our best guys are and how we get them the ball and, and, um, and not try and say this is our offense. We, you have to adapt to what we want to do. We want to be multiple enough where we can adapt to, to our personnel. Hey, Shane, can you kind of uh, give an update of what you've seen in the competition in the, the cornerback room and, and how that's been playing out through? I know it's only four practices, but what you're liking from those guys? Yeah, um, another one where there's it's, it's neat watching that, <clears throat> that battle in there. Obviously, you got guys like Judge Collier who started a couple games for us last year. He, he is long and, and athletic and, and has 
work to get stronger as well. So he's one, someone that started a couple games last season and, and has some experience. Um, you know, David Spalding's working quite a bit out there right now. David's kind of kind of does everything safety nickel corner but he's been out there you talk about uh vicari swain who's out there as well um Jalua solomon comes in this summer we'll throw him into the mix out there as well and then you know o'donnell's kind of on that other side right now and he's competing with all of them but all those guys are battling out to figure out who's on the other side but they're all mixing it in there um you know i know you guys think i'm full of it when I say there's no like real depth chart now we have okay you're the first group today but it might be whenever the next media availability is you'll be out there and see okay here's the starting 11 on offense and defense well it is for that period and then maybe the next time we do a team period it's a different corner out there taking group work with getting work with the ones and and then the thing that's helping us too right now Jordan is just the fact that um, because we have pretty much our entire team here right now, except for three scholarship freshmen and some walk-ons that we'll get here in the summertime, we're able to uh, set up these practices just like we do in August, meaning that we're, we're everyone's getting reps. And when we're doing a team period, most of the time we have an 11 on 11 group going on on one field and then we have 11 on 11 going on on a separate field so everybody is is getting reps so because of that you know it might be okay vacari you're on this field today this period next period you're over here on the other field emory you're over here this period next period you're over there and uh they're all getting a ton of work and then we're able to get in there and evaluate the tape and go from there so it's uh pleased with the progress they've they've i've seen them make a lot of plays and uh, got to continue to and just show that consistency and details to, to uh, do what we need them to do. Back to back. <laughs> wow. Can, yeah, what, I think there's a lot of people who look at the, uh, the wide receivers and it's, it's Nick who's just a, a freak of nature and then you know, a lot of guys who are you know, not six feet tall, you know, 220 pounds or whatever, but you know, Gage was in here yesterday and saying, hey, we can catch the deep ball. We can, you know, do bubble screens. We have so much versatility. What do you like from those guys right now? And is that a position that you might address in the transfer portal? Or are you feeling good about what you've seen out of those guys through four practices? Yeah, I think with every single position that we have, we're always looking to increase the depth and the competition. Um, so I wouldn't say there's any position that we look at and say we absolutely wouldn't take somebody if there was somebody out there that fit us and, and had a chance to make us better. Um, I like that. I like that group. No, they're not. They're not Xavier Leggett and and big from that standpoint. They all don't look like uh, Nick Harbor. So in some ways, that's a little concerning because in today's time, you need big bodies out there on the perimeter and. And uh, when you have those, you know, 50-50 balls, meaning you and the you and the DB are there and having a chance to make a play, a competitive catch, you got the size to get out there and, and win those battles without a doubt. Um, but having said that, there's also a benefit to those guys as well. I mean, we've played. There have been some, you know, championship teams that have won championships in this league and nationally that they didn't have overly big receivers. I mean. I saw Devontae Smith when I was at Georgia catch a touchdown pass to beat us in the national championship game. He's not a very big guy, but he's got a great skill set. And I think that's what these guys bring to the table. They can they can catch a ball. Uh, I think it was Gage today, caught a little screen, basically the same play we were through to uh, on the th third down against Clemson two years ago up there, essentially the same type screen. And Gage caught that ball and made one guy miss, and he's out of there for a touchdown. You know, so a lot of that ability, um, jitterbug isn't the word but that I'm looking for, but y'all know what I mean. Shifty, <laughs> tough to tackle um, as well once you get the ball in their hands. So we'll be creative with our personnel and, and, um, and, and continuing to find ways to best utilize those guys. And then when you have a deep tight end group that's athletic like we have as well, that makes up for maybe a lack of size that you have out there at the receiver position also. Shane, there's a lot of excitement with those running backs that have come in via the transfer portal, and rightfully so, but I feel like DJ Braswell kind of gets lost in the mix a little bit, especially after what he was able to do for you guys, stepping up, playing more, in, yeah. more than four games last year towards the end of the season. What have you seen from him, not just this early into spring, 
but just his growth, maybe size and everything from the offseason weightlifting program. Yeah, uh, he came in as a true freshman and did some things. Y'all heard me talk about it. The game winning touchdown pass against Kentucky was made possible because of a great blitz pickup that he made where he had to come across the formation and pick up a linebacker or a, a guy coming on the pressure, which is big for a um, for any running back to do, but especially a true freshman. I think with DJ, it was very much, you know, we tell our, I told the running backs <clears throat> back in January that, look, yeah, we brought in three transfer running backs, talking to Juju and DJ and all those returning guys, and that's not necessarily a knock on you, but that is a opportunity. One, we showed last year with all the injuries we had at running back that you need more than three scholarship running backs. I told you guys before, I was at Virginia Tech and we lost four in one season uh, back in 2014 or 15 and uh, 14. Uh, so we want to increase the depth, but also it's time for DJ or whoever else to, to step up as well. And I think he took that to heart that, okay, you brought in three running backs, I'm gonna work and he's got a ways to go, but he worked in the weight room. He's, he can run, there's no question about it. He continues to get stronger and then being able to do all the things that we want our running backs to do. It's not just running the ball, it's all the other stuff, protections, passing game, all uh, and special teams, and uh, he's continuing to get better. So that's a, another great room with competition. Love what Oscar brings to the table. We'll love what Rocket brings to the table. Really excited about Jawarn Howe. And then to go along with Juju and DJ and Bradley Dunn and. Chase McCracken, Nathan Harris Wayne, and some of the other running backs that we have here in the program. It's a good group. Coach, I know it's still early in spring ball, but freshmen tend to play a lot on your on your defense, just finding their way through the rubble. Um, last week you were talking about your linebackers and Wendell Gregory and, and uh, Fred J.R. Johnson. Yeah. Are there any freshmen that you can give me just at this point? I know, again, like I said, it's still early, but any guys that you could see that could potentially break through? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's hard not to notice those guys um, all across the board when you talk about the three freshmen on the offensive line, Josiah, Cam, and Blake. You know, they're going to be really good players. Um, you know, when you look at those receivers, Maisie O'Bennett and, and DeBron Gatlin, really excited about some of the things that they continue uh, to do. Obviously, uh, Dylan Stewart is as advertised and has really been impressive in four days as well. Fred and Wendell really, really uh, excited about, you know, so all of them, can I say that and take the easy way out? But no, I think with all these guys, I mean, we're trying to, there's no one, I'll say this, through four practices where we said, okay, man, he's probably a year away. Um, not really going to be able to count on him. In our minds, we've got a long way till we play, but let's try and get them all ready to play. And none of them have given us any reason to think that, that they can't um, from uh, either. They, it's a good group. And, and um, you know, whether it be special teams, whether it be offense, whether it be defense, let's find a role for them and get them out there and, and get them going. But we're definitely, it's a, it's a uh, athletic group. You know, we are absolutely, you mentioned Fred and Wendell specifically, we are absolutely um, more athletic at linebacker. And that's a, not, a knock on anybody that's not here, the two guys that, that left. But these guys, when you talk about the two true freshmen and you talk about uh, Bengali Kamara and Demetrius Knight, those are two really, really, really good players. Um, that were very productive at their previous schools and two really, really talented freshmen that are long and athletic and, and what you want from a size standpoint. Nothing, Phil? Nothing? Oh, man. All right, well, we can write a note. We'll get it up here and answer it. Good? All right, thank you all. Have a good week. Well, uh, I've been here three years, Tyler. Three years. Did he just set a record? That's never happened. That has never <laughs> happened before. That, um, <laughs> man, that was right under wow. 20 minutes. That's a record. Wow. Well, we're sitting here, and we're, you know, we're both listening to it. I'm in the host room, and you're in the producer room, and I hear him pause, and usually... Somebody pops up with a question, and then the pause, he goes, Is that it? That's it? And I'm sitting here going, that's it? I'm almost surprised at Shane. All right, so there's Shane Bieber's uh, presser. 
interesting. <laughs> which, which to, to be fair, so we heard from him last Tuesday, which yes. was the start of spring practice. Mm-hmm. There's all the questions about the new guys coming in, mm-hmm. what you see in day one, and all that kind of stuff. They've only had a handful of practices since then. Today was practice number four, which they right. wrapped up before his press conference. I don't know how much has really changed since then. Well, we even being talked honest. about it a few minutes ago. Yeah. About there's probably not going to be a lot that's different because it hasn't been a whole lot going on since the last time Shane talked. Well, look, we appreciate Shane talking sure. as much as he does. But in this instance, there probably isn't a lot of new ground to cover. And... But I was just stunned because that hasn't happened in my three years here where it's like, <laughs> well, we're done. All right, cool. Okay, I gonna, then. I would say Co- Coach Beamer is extremely consistent with 30-minute press conferences, like usually to a T, sometimes over, but at least 30 minutes worth of conversation usually. Yeah, it just – that was <laughs> – I look, I'm not dogging anybody. I just no, thought it was not funny. At all. I was laughing. I'm like, this is over? Okay. Because <laughs> usually – just to give you a little behind the curtain is because we're now, you know, a network in other markets, you know, everything is so timed out here Sure. to specific moments and windows. And like, for an example, you know, usually Shane will go a little bit past our windows. So we record everything obviously. And then if there's, then we bring back the stuff that we couldn't air because we can only air like roughly 20, 24, 26 minutes. Sure. And then Shane will usually go about 30, maybe 35. And so we always got to pull the extra and then go, okay, let's get the extra because we want, you know, yeah, yeah. you know, listeners to hear it. But we don't have to worry about it this time. Got the whole bleeping thing in right there, Tyler. Bam. Very nice. Very good. I mean, again, it wasn't a whole lot of new ground to plow. I thought it was interesting where he said Dylan Stewart's the real deal. Yeah, which that's what we're hoping to hear. Obviously, when the guy comes in with that bunch of hype, as a five star, especially at a spot that again wasn't great a season ago at you know the edge spot, um, you hope that guy's going to be able to come in and make an impact right away. Yeah, and li- look, even if it's in certain packages where it's just like Dylan, when they snap the ball, go go knock the bleep out of the quarterback for us. Thank you very much. Right, but in some way he can affect games, and that's what you're hoping for in whatever amount of snaps he gets. But you know, he's a guy again. They are hoping can be that special rare freshman who can come into the sec and you know do some damage it happens it doesn't happen a lot but you know i mean we saw a three-star running back that nobody thought about land at oxford mississippi named judkins and what did he do as a freshman went crazy did pretty good now he's in columbus yeah but exactly but it's just the idea that freshmen do pop in this league it just doesn't happen a lot Especially when the, oh, we talk about the offensive line. Put God love a freshman offensive lineman in the SEC. Good luck. Go get them. It's gonna be a. It's gonna be a, a year. It's gonna be a year of hard knocks and learning. It's a year of hard knocks and learning. But when they come back the next season, we all say, "Well, I'm glad, so glad they got that experience last oh, yeah. year. So glad they got their brains beat in last year because now they're gonna be a lot better for it." It's like it's like your parents would do that for you. Well, did you learn a lesson there. Hope you learned a lesson for that, and you can move on from that. Bet, bet you won't do that again. You know, my, my dad always said, my Dean Ford, and I will clean it up for radio, he always said, boy, you screw-ups. Screw-up ain't a screw-up if you learn from it. If you learn from it, it's a life lesson. Now, if you keep screwing up, it becomes a mistake. And if you keep screwing up, you're going to get your butt in trouble. That was always my dad's line about getting it handed to you. If you learn from it, it was a lesson. That's right. Yeah. Problem is, I didn't learn from him a lot. I just kept doing it over and over again. And it became, I got in trouble. Funny how that works. Yeah, it's weird when you're 17. All right, we'll get back here and talk a little bit about what, what uh, Coach Shane Beamer said. And we'll get some Shane Beamer on for you between now and 3 o'clock as well. If you missed any of uh, Shane's press or just a few minutes ago talking about spring practice, football, football, football in the 1 o'clock hour right here on the game.
Halftime show. Terry Ford Tyler head as we uh, cook this sucker till three here on the game. Football, football, football. We'll start, start with uh, Shane Beamer uh, discussing spring practice. Not a whole lot was different uh, in a week, roughly. Um, and, you know, Shane, I thought, again, we brought up the Dylan Stewart comments, Tyler. Also, I thought it was interesting. The cornerback battle is going to be fun. For sure. Um, yeah, Judge Collier got run last year, but the, the guy everyone talks about is Vakari Swain. Came in as a four-star. There were a lot of people I've talked to who were surprised he didn't get more run at DB last year. I was going to say, I don't think there was a guy in the defensive secondary that got talked more about when Wes, Chris, and I were you know, discussing things through last season than Vakari Swain and what his upside potential was what his ceiling they felt he was going to be in this defense and like you said didn't get a lot of run out there but here's a guy that now going into his second year and his second time around in spring practice could be set to make a big jump in year number two yeah because everybody raved about the athleticism and some of his skill level you know as a defensive back so it's going to be interesting to see what Swain could bring this year and really the way you know we've seen them play young freshman yeah. D- defensive well, backs, the fact maybe, you know, the thing about Swain is, again, we weren't there. Sure. It could be you see a lot of athleticism. You see the ability in the high ceiling, and maybe technically there was some things that he and, had to learn coming from high school and transitioning to the SEC. And that's what you run into a lot of times, especially with high-caliber talent. Sometimes they can be very raw at that position. We talk about Nick Harbour all the time and, you know, his rawness at wide receiver, which wasn't a natural position for him, um, you know, prior to getting to South Carolina. So there's certainly a learning curve. And, uh, again, you know, you had confident guys playing at the cornerback spot a season ago, but we did think that Bacardi Swain was maybe going to factor in a little bit more, so it'll be interesting to see uh, how that shakes out as of right now because you had to have O'Donnell Fortune as a senior most guy there, but then you have a, a lot of underclassmen after that. Yeah, and we'll see how it shakes out. I mean, we, we, we pretty much know the safety. If you feel, feel like we know the safety and the nickel. Yeah. We feel like we know those three those three spots, it, it we seemed, think. I was going to say, you kind of settled into the nickel with Jalon Kilgore as the season went along last year, and, and he wasn't perfect at that spot but he ended up being the best out of the however many guys you end up rotating through there um so so yeah it'll be interesting to see what they decide to do in the secondary as a whole now we always forget about that d word you know development guys can actually get better and you know in the back end last year and we discussed it year before you had three corners mm-hmm. two or two nfl caliber yeah corners. i mean you had three corners and one of those corners would drop in and cover the slot right So you had cover guys on the slot. Last year, you had safeties on the slot. And safeties who were better in run support Mm -hmm. and maybe better in zone than they were man up on a slot receiver or in man coverage. Yeah, when it came to staying step for step with, you know, one of those slot guys, I mean, think about what Ricky Pearsall did, you know, with Florida when they came to town. He was a big part of them winning that game at the Mm -hmm. end, converting those fourth downs because the coverage wasn't as good. As it, um, as it certainly could have been there. So, yeah, that's something you definitely want to improve on, not only from the standpoint of the guys that you have, but there's another portal cycle coming up. If you don't like what you have through four weeks of spring practice, then you can say, you know what, I think we need to go out in a portal and address this spot. And to be fair, once they tweaked the defense going to November, also they, they did some different coverage things in the secondary to help those safeties yeah. to where they weren't as much man up as they were through the earlier part of the year. So we'll see a lot of young potential in the back end of the defense. We'll see how all that plays itself out. But Shane talking to the media also brought up your guy. You know, you know little Robbie Ashford over there? Uh, I have quite a bit of Robbie Ashford, by the way. Uh, well, so what, let's get what to that story in the next Ashford segment. Do you want to hear? Well, is the better let's question. get to some. Let's, let's zone in on Robbie Ashford in the next segment. All right. Because I don't want to start it and stop it. I want to. So I want to kind of focus on Robbie Ashford. I, let me tell you why I like Robbie Ashford so much. I appreciate him from the standpoint if he gives long, thorough answers. And that's not knocking these other guys. But a lot of times when you get these players behind microphones in front of cameras, they're very reserved. They don't really want to go into detail. And they can cling to some of the same cliches Mm -hmm. over and over again. Robbie Ashford, I didn't include this because it was such a long answer yesterday. He got asked who he thought, like, impressed him. He went on a four- to five-minute answer, and I think he said every name on the roster <laughs> over the course of that period of time. Like, he, he's thorough and very insightful, and I appreciate that, especially for a guy that's been around the college game for several years. Well, I'll tell you what, what I thought was refreshing when they made the, new, the newcomers, the new players available to the media over at the football complex. And Robbie was great. Robbie's like, eh, nobody's ever 
develop me for squad as a quarterback. Yeah, he's he's honest. Nobody ever worked with me. Nobody yeah. made me better. Well, and and he was obviously at Auburn last season with Hugh Freeze came in, and he was kind of the the incumbent quarterback in that situation. And Hugh Freeze looked at him and said, "Yeah, I don't want you. I'm going to bring in Peyton Thorne." Mm-hmm. Because that worked out really well. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, just kind of cast Robbie Ashford to the side. Yeah, y- you know how much the uh, new head coach thinks of you when the first thing he does, he goes and gets another dude who, let's be honest, it wasn't like, you know, there were lots of people falling over themselves to go get Peyton Thorne in the first place. Sure. Um, and then Hugh Freeze came in and just went and got the best available quarterback or the best quarterback he could find that would come to Auburn. So Robbie Ashford was odd man out. Sure. Boom, done. And, you know, and we talk about Robbie Ashford. You know, we always say, hey, you know, these struggles throwing the football consistently. Consistently. And he, of course, his answer to that was, nobody's ever worked with me. Right. Nobody's ever developed me because I want to come and play for Dow Loggins um, because I want someone who's going to develop me as a quarterback. Now, here's the interesting part. We all believe Lenora Sellers is going to be the guy at quarterback. Yes. But let's say, and this is just, you know, I mean, we got time to kill. It's football, football, football. You know, and Shane even, Shane even only went 20 minutes. Um, let's say you bring in Robbie Ashford. Let's say Dow Loggins tweaks the footwork, works with his mechanics, and all of a sudden, oh, my God, he throws the ball much more consistent. That would be quite interesting just to say, look, there are guys that do that. I mean, it, NFL guys, Josh Allen. You know, he mm-hmm. did that. You know, our guy Jalen Hurts in Philadelphia did that. We we could give Dow Loggins the moniker of quarterback whisperer. Yes. Hey. Hey, Robbie. Come here. Throw it over there. <laughs> Take two you know, steps. That's so funny. We always joke about, like, because, uh, you know, that came from that movie, The Horse Whisperer, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have any minutes of that movie I've seen in my life? Probably none. Zero. Same. Zero. Um, I just know that Robert Redford could... Well, Get the most out of a horse, whatever and, that means. And I feel like that's a moniker that gets attached to, like, every single offensive coordinator in the NFL at this point. Oh, he's a quarterback whisperer. Like, what does that actually mean do, do in the really grand scheme of things? Hey, hey, come here. Hey, you see that guy over there? Throw the ball to him. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, Throw it to where he can catch it. Thank you. But, but it, it's a little more mm, few and far between when you talk about college as far as coordinators, quarterbacks, coaches, whatever it may be, that can truly develop talent at the quarterback spot. And you bring in a guy like Robbie Ashford, you do wonder, okay, how many old habits are you going to have to knock if you are trying to develop him? Because he's not this raw 17, 18-year-old kid who's getting fresh out of high school. He's a grown man that's been around the game for several years. And you know what, honestly, it works. It doesn't work for everybody. Sure. Some guys can't break what they've done, no matter how hard they try. Like Tim Tebow, God love him, he tried. I remember well, reading articles about Tebow in the offseason trying to change his delivery, change oh. this, change that, change his Wait. footwork. and When you have the most unorthodox skill set of probably any quarterback in recent memory, it's hard to shake. Yeah, and he just couldn't. No matter what he would do, like working out and in practices and stuff, his muscle memory would go back to what yeah. he's always done. His, whatever that weird throwing yeah. motion was. And, and, and as great a quarterback as he was in college, that just didn't translate to the NFL. No matter how hard he tried to fix it, he couldn't fix it. Now, sometimes Demarius Thomas just runs 80 yards, and the people, you know, Harold Jew is a hero. Seven-yard slant. That's right. It's like, Seven. yeah, I think, I think DT did most of the work on that one, Tebow. You see that long touchdown pass? No, it really was a long uh, run off a short reception. Right. That's okay. Because, again, Team Tebow was a great college quarterback, and he deserves all the accolades he's gotten as a college quarterback. He just didn't translate to the NFL. That's all. Right. He just couldn't translate that skill set. But he tried. The point of he tried, it just didn't work. Some quarterbacks just can't snap themselves out of what they've done their whole lives, and I mean, some can. I can't, I can't hit dump-off passes on the goal line in the NFL and <laughs> um, win a Super Bowl? Yeah, they, you know, things are a little different in the NFL. Well, you know, and Josh Allen... After his first couple of years, he's like, I got, I got, I got to redo this from the ground up. Mm-hmm. I can't, I can't be successful the way I want to in this league if I don't just rebuild my mechanics. Right. And starts with your footwork because everything starts with the footwork. And he did it. Jalen Hurts started doing it his last year at Alabama, and then he went to Oklahoma, and then all of a sudden he worked even harder when he got to Philly. And he made himself a more consistent thrower of the football. He wasn't that guy early in his career at Bama where he wouldn't have got replaced by Tua Tungavailoa. No, he always had the arm, but the consistency wasn't there. Again, that's that footwork, the mechanics. It's so funny, man. Once I learned 
when you talk to real like quarterback whispers, they tell you it all starts with the feet. Mm-hmm. The ball is going nowhere where the feet aren't taking it. Right. And a lot of like we'll go up to our boy at Tennessee, bazooka arm Joe Milton. His footwork's terrible. And they even pointed out that the, the, the Tennessee South Carolina game last year. They were going over his footwork over and over and over and over again, just showing you, okay, when he made a nice throw, well, look at that footwork. When he made a terrible throw, well, there was no footwork. Right. The whole thing starts with the feet. So maybe, you know, you get a Robbie Ashford in here, and maybe he's a guy that you can, you know, break it down and rebuild it because he's open to it because he brought it up to us, right? He brought it up to the media. So maybe he's a guy that can you can make him a more consistent throw of the football if you can rebuild the mechanics that might have never been developed. And Lenore Sellers, by the way, can get better with Dow Loggins with his footwork. Look at Spencer Rattler from year one at South Carolina to year two. Right. You see the improvement. You see the difference in how he played. I mean, Dow Loggins pretty much squeezed the gunslinger out of him, and he became much more efficient and much more selective in how he made throws he just didn't go back there and go yeah then my my guy might be triple covered you see my arm watch this baby it was like a looney tunes cartoon when the ball goes through all three guys to his guy yep you know i just he you can see the dow loggins influence on rattler last year i remember i remember when jay and i had we were talking to dow loggins at uh birdies with beamer and we asked him dow how do you take those dangerous gunslinger throws out of Spencer Rattler's game without taking away what makes Spencer Rattler Spencer Rattler. And, you know, he gave us an answer. Well, that's that's the tough part is you want to keep them with that cocky gunslinger mentality without actually making some of those throws that you don't want him to make. And obviously, whatever whatever he did, whatever kind of sprinkled dust he put on him, it worked, right? Yeah, absolutely. Rattler was mu- much more selective in how he made throws. He kept the ball safe for the most part. Some of his picks were at end of games. They were down. He's trying to make something happen. You know, he's running for his life, and all of a sudden he just makes a throw down the field hoping that it'll bounce off somebody's helmet. But Spencer Rattler, watching him in year one to year two, you could see, and look, I'm not going to, we got to give Rattler credit too for working on his game. But you could see Dow Loggins had an effect on Rattler, there's no doubt. And maybe it'll have the same effect on Ashford and sellers. Let's hear some Robbie Ashford coming back. Uh, the new South Carolina uh, dude in the quarterback room. That's coming up here on the game. Do not forget Friday. Let's get it out here now. Women's basketball, Sweet 16 against Indiana. You hear it on our sister station, 98.5 WOMG. Game, pregame 4.30, tip 5 o'clock. Again, pregame 4.30, tip 5 o'clock. On our sister station, 98.5 WOMG, because we have baseball later that night with South Carolina and Alabama. So the women in the Sweet 16, again, on our sister station, 98.5 WOMG. I will right, we'll come back in here. Here's some Robbie Ashford. See what the new uh, South Carolina quarterback uh, thinks about many things. That's next on the game.
All right, we are rolling football, football, football in the 1 o'clock hour uh, here on the game, sponsored by Atlantic Windows and Doors. All right, a uh, bunch of players uh, talking this week. We got some sound. Quarterbacks we're concentrating on in this hour as we talk football, football, football with the Gamecocks. Robbie Ashford, a uh, couple different cuts from uh, the new uh, South Carolina quarterback. Of course, Ashford played at Auburn. Before that was at Oregon, a four-star recruit coming out of high school. Here's Ashford talking about adjusting to being at South Carolina. They've been great. I mean, you know, just getting to be around those guys, getting to actually play ball now. It's just good to see how everybody moves, how everybody does things. Uh, for me, just learning new offense. I mean, it's, it's really different than what I played in in Auburn. The one I played in Auburn was simple. Two word calls, go. But now I'm playing in a more pro pro ready offense and so it's been a good adjustment just having coach Delo and uh coach Shula just to help me because they're guys who have been in the league so they've definitely taught me a lot and just coming in just knowing the mistakes I made and just coming in and correcting them and just not trying to make those again some we emphasize heavy but uh it's been great our room has been and been great just nothing but competition nothing but love and uh, you can just see the competition going throughout this whole team so it's been a great first three days and I'm ex excited to see how it just keeps going it's very interesting first of all the comparison to the uh, offenses with it, Oregon and South Carolina I did think that was interesting and it makes me wonder what would he have thought of Satterfield's offense a couple seasons ago <laughs> he thought that South Carolina's was a lot, a lot more complex than what he was doing at Auburn well Auburn it was like two words right yeah throw and ball run run uh run left yeah <laughs> don't ready three words for you Robbie don't throw it yeah just run uh with Marcus Satterfield the two words would be what huh yeah. what Confused. Now, Satterfield gives you a, an algebra equation. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, and again, God love him. He was a smart man and knew his stuff. I'm sure on a whiteboard, he would wow you. But then when you go to apply it to the players, they're going, huh? It's like you realize they're not all in the same football mind level as you. And you know that they only have X amount of hours to get this in their system in college, Marcus. They're, they're writing down plays on their history homework right. by accident. <laughs> you know, that's one thing when Dow Loggins came in. He said, look, you only get so many hours to work with these, these, these young fellows during the week, so you can't make it too complicated or complex. You want them to be able to quickly ingest it in their brain so they can go play and not think. And I think Marcus Satterfield, they were thinking so much more than they were playing. Right. And that's at the end of the year where Shane had that, you know, come to Jesus, where, you know, think less, play more. Let's take well, the big the big uh, Denny's menu. Uh, Let's wipe uh, out the salmon. And then then Satterfield said, "Hey, uh, Coach Rule uh, wants me to come. Go. Yep. Uh, Don't let me stop you. Go. <laughs> great opportunity. It. Go Ready? ahead. Let me think about it. Okay, you can go. Are you sure? Yeah. Go ahead. In fact, here's your bags. <laughs> Packed them for you. It's like <laughs> cars full. Office is cleaned out. Thanks, Marcus, for here's, everything. Here's your plane ticket. I appreciate you. Did you have this before I came in? I had it at my desk just in case. Just been waiting. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, this offense, you know, not as simple as obviously two words like Auburn, but, you know, so it'll be interesting to see how Robbie Ashford can, you know, get into that. He brought up Mike Shula as well. And, of course, Mike Shula only was a head coach for four years, and I was at Bama. It did not go well. It's the last guy before Saban. Yep. I mean, Mike Shula, 10 and 23 in his career at Bama. Not Bama standards. No. And Shula has been an assistant coach, though, in the NFL. He's been an OC, if my memory serves me. Got pretty good lineage. Yeah, kind of his dad was pretty good at this coaching thing. Pretty great. Yeah, one of the all-time greatest. And so you bring a depth. And, and by the way, Mike Shula played quarterback yes. at Bama, so he's yes. played the position. So that helps out as well. All right, so Robbie Ashford, another thing uh, Robbie Ashford brought up is what's different about him at this point in his career. Now, remember, came in as a four-star, highly touted four-star quarterback recruit to Oregon, then went to Auburn, not to play for Hugh Freeze, but to play for Brian Harson. And now he's on his third school here in South Carolina. Here's Robbie Ashford now compared to the early version of Robbie Ashford, according to Robbie Ashford. I mean, just the first thing is... Uh... I knew when I first came into college it was going to be a learning year. We had older guys at Oregon and, uh, you know, just come in there and try and learn everything you can and uh, some circumstances don't go your way. And uh, that taught me a lot when I was a freshman, just life isn't easy. Uh, I mean, that's been a testament to my life. There have been a lot of bad things happening to me, but I'm still here, so it's just a blessing. But you learn in college that 
Hey, it's a business, and uh, you're not gonna always get what you want, but it doesn't mean you stop working. And uh, that's what I learned from my freshman year just to now, just the situations I've been through, the hardships I've gone through, it's taught me, hey, life isn't easy. Life, life's gonna try and kick you down, but it's just how do you bounce back? How do you keep going? And uh, that's been really big, and I just try and bring that here because I know it might be some days I might not practice the way I want to. It's like, okay, I know I'm human. I can't let that defeat me and defeat me for the next practice and the practice after that. I got to go in there, go see what I did wrong, uh, come back and just not make those mistakes again and just have fun. I mean, having fun, it sounds, like I said, cliche, but when you're having fun, you're the best version of yourself. And uh, I feel like a lot of guys, we can get up tight and just – try and do too much and that takes the fun out of it and that takes us from just being able to do what we do. So I would say those are two big things and then just just hard work. I mean, just working. The work never stops. And uh, you know, as a freshman, you're like, man, this is a lot. But as the years go on, you're like, okay, this is just like clockwork. It's just come in, do it, know what you gotta do, know what you gotta do extra and then just repeat it every single day. So that's what I would say I've learned. And we'll see where that goes. I mean, the younger version of you is learning one thing and the older version of you now kind of, you know, you got more experience, you understand things a little bit better, and then you just kind of move forward with it, more experience and you handle things better, obviously, as you get older. Yeah, absolutely. And Coach Beamer alluded to this in his presser last hour. This is a guy that comes in here with experience starting in the SEC for basically a full season at Auburn a couple of years ago. That's valuable. No matter how good or bad it went for Ashford in that season, it's still valuable. And this is something that I talked about a little bit earlier you know, Lenora Sellers, who, again, we project to be the starter when the season does roll around, comes in a season ago. Spencer Rattler was the guy. There was no debate about that going into the season. There was no real competition at the quarterback spot. So Lenora Sellers got to sit behind him and learn and marinate for an entire year around uh, behind a guy that had been in college for four or five years at that, at that point, had tons of games under his belt, had seen and done just about everything and every situation that you could imagine. So that's kind of your starting point. Well, now he's going to be the guy taking over the reins and assuming that that is how it ends up working out. You still have a veteran behind you and even Davis Bevel as well, who started yeah. a game at Oklahoma um, and has been around the game for a while himself. You can lean on when you need it. Maybe you're not going to need them as much as you needed a Spencer Rattler in year number one, but in your first year as a starting quarterback, you're going to run into things that you may need a, a second opinion on or may need an extra set of eyes or ears to say hey here's what I thought about this here's my scenario what do you think or did you deal with this in your past at Auburn or whatever it may be and having a guy like Robbie Ashford behind him as his backup quarterback can be extremely valuable to Lenora Sellers this season all right so we'll get some more South Carolina sound here we're going to switch gears a little bit uh we got a guest Evan Cohen uh one of the co-hosts of the new ESPN um radio show on sportsmanlike conduct along with Chris Canty Michelle Smallwood uh, Evan's going to jump on with us and yap some football. A lot of goings on in the NFL. Absolutely. But first. Oh, we got to give away some tickets. Got some tickets to give away. I say we give away two pair of tickets right now. Caller number three and four. What are they for again, Tyler? It is for next weekend's. Not this weekend because they're on the road, but next weekend's um, baseball game out at Founders Park as South Carolina welcomes in Texas A&M. This will be for Friday's game. So Friday night games next week, baseball versus Texas A&M. All right, so give us a call right now. Caller three and four. And Evan Cohen from ESPN Radio going to talk some football with us next here on the halftime show on the game.
All right, halftime show. Terry Ford Tyler here on the game uh, from ESPN Radio. So is it really brand new anymore, Evans? You guys have been around a bit now. You're still brand new. Do you feel like you get that brand new show smell on you? Uh, yeah, I mean, Terry, it's only been six and a half months, six months. So, yeah, I think so, right? Like, you think about a six-month-old six baby or a seven-month-old baby. Yeah, that's brand new. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It's like seven month old baby's not driving a car and smoking cigars. Good point. When you're right, you're no, right. I mean literally literally I was with you two weeks ago. We were at a party together. You and I are talking and you literally to said to me, which I appreciate you know, you guys are doing a really good job with the new show. Well, I'm going to go based on what you said. You called us the new show. <laughs> That's true. On sports with like ESPN Radio. You know, I give you credit, my friend, before we get into talking about NFL and Shohei Atani and stuff, that you argue with a very large man every day. And I give you credit. Chris uh, Canty, I stood next to him at that party. Dude's like 6'7", still carting way over 200 pounds. You ever worry he's going to get a flashback and just knock the hell out of you? Well, you actually undersold him. He's six foot eight, three hundred and fifty pounds. Oh my God! He is enormous. But I know this is going to sound crazy. He doesn't feel that big to me anymore, just because I'm around him every day. But I know you were not the only person at that party who came up to me and said, "Wow, he is really tall. He towers over everyone." <laughs> Uh, Evan, let me ask you, asking for our men's basketball team here, does he have any eligibility left, and can he play in the post? <laughs> okay, I have asked Canty about playing football right now because what happens is we will see, and I know you're asking about basketball, but I'm making a point on this. So we will see these contracts roll in. And Chris Canty, for those who are unaware, played at UVA. He spent time in the Carolinas. By the way, also has a house in South Carolina and spends a lot of time um, in the area. And – he sees these contracts coming in with these defensive linemen, defensive tackles, whatever it is, plays for the Cowboys, Ravens, and Giants. And I always say, doesn't it make you want to go back? Just get a one-year deal. And he always says, absolutely not. He couldn't even play one play today. <laughs> and that's the kind of thing you guys have been around athletes that makes you realize, like, they stop, most of them, because they can't physically do it anymore. That he has literally said he could not play one play play anymore because of all the injuries he's had. Chase, Evan Cohen with us from Unsportsman like on ESPN radio from uh, 6 to 10 a.m. I heard you this morning and you were talking to Mike Tannenbaum and yeah. f former NFL GM uh, and Tannenbaum had his mock draft up and Tannenbaum was talking about, you know, Arizona taking J.J. McCarthy at four, the Michigan quarterback, and then trading Kyler Murray. And he goes to this whole thing. And give your response to his whole idea about Kyler Murray uh, being dealt to Minnesota and the Cardinals taking J.J. McCarthy. I thought what you said was very interesting. Well, he said to me, he said, well, who says no? <laughs> and I said, well, Minnesota should. And he said, why? And I said, I don't want Kyler Murray as my quarterback. Like, Kyler Murray is short. He has been fine in the league, but, like, hasn't been unbelievable in the league. And for me, I have a hard time getting over the fact that they put a study hall clause in the contract with Kyler Murray. It, whether it's fair or not, it makes me think he doesn't love it like some others. Like, for example, I promise you, C.J. Stroud with the Houston Texans does not need a study hall clause. <laughs> I promise you, Lamar Jackson does not need a study hall clause. I promise you, Patrick Mahomes does not need a study hall clause, right? And so, you know, when he was asking me about that, who says no, I, that's not exciting to me if I'm Minnesota. And you can say, well, that's better than Sam Darnold. Yes, Kyler Murray is better than their current quarterback, Sam Darnold. But my whole point is, I call Arizona's bluff, guys. I would make Arizona pick at four. I don't believe for a second they're actually going to pick a quarterback at four. Even though I like Mike's idea, I think they should. I just don't know if they're going to definitely have a taker for Kyler Murray. Uh, you're right about the Sam Darnold thing. Sam Malone. I'll take Sam Malone over Sam Darnold. Sam, Sam Malone, Malone from Cheers, you will yes. take over him. Wow, yes. that's an interesting one. Not a Sam Darnold guy. Not a Sam Darnold guy. Uh, Evan Cohen hanging out with us from Sportsman Like on ESPN Radio, uh, 6 to 10 weekday mornings. Uh, halftime show, Terry Ford, Tyler Head. All right, let's look at this. You've talked to a million mock drafters, a million scouts, GMs. You guys have your opinion. Okay, if you're sitting there at two, it's Jaden Daniels or it's Drake May. 
Who is the GM, Mr. Cohen, taking if he's on the clock? Well, can I just throw a wrinkle into this? Sure. I know you're asking me a question on this, but I want to throw a wrinkle. Go for it. Uh, there's some buzz that maybe J.J. McCarthy goes to overall. Really? Now, do you agree? Are you down with that? Would you take J.J. McCarthy? So here's my thing on J.J. McCarthy. I'm not going to claim to be have watched every play of Drake May or Jaden Daniels or J.J. McCarthy. But the knock on J.J. McCarthy is that he hasn't done what he hasn't been asked to do. And what I mean by that is everyone always goes to the place with him of, well, all he does is X, Y, and Z. Well, that's all Harbaugh asked him to do. Like, it's the, you know, Michelle Smallman, the third member of our team, um, you know, not third member, but of, of three of us, right? Like, on our team, on, on Unsportsman, like, said it either today or yesterday, I forgot, and she had a great comparison. She goes, we're holding against J.J. McCarthy the same way we hold it against Brock Purdy because people always say, well, what if he didn't have Christian McCaffrey or Debo Samuel or Brandon Ayuk? But he does, right? And when he has those guys, he's great with them. Oh, well, what if J.J. McCarthy was asked to move in the pocket like Drake May and Jaden Daniels were and had less talent like those two guys maybe didn't have in comparison to what Michigan had and Harbaugh, et cetera? Well, what do you want him to do? Like, do you want him to go and say, you know what, Michigan, I'm sorry. I know we have a ton of pros and I have a pro head coach. I'm going to now go to a community college with worse talent, worse coaching, worse players because I need to prove to people otherwise. Like, here's the thing. Terry, if you tell me that J.J. McCarthy is just going to continue the path of that he's been on at Michigan of just when he's playing with good players and when there's good coaching around him, He's going to win? You're not intrigued for that? <laughs> I, I hear you. Evan, how much does having played under Jim Harbaugh help him out in that regard as opposed to if he played for – he brought a Brock Purdy like Matt Campbell, who does a great job at Iowa State, by the way, but he's obviously never been at the NFL level as a head coach. You know, how much would, weight does that hold for the argument of McCarthy maybe climbing up draft boards? But Tyler, you tell me. Because, and what I mean – like, here's the question I'll ask you in return. If the best quarterback evaluator out there is biased in your favor and vouches for you, isn't that a good thing? Yeah, sounds pretty good. Evan Cohen hanging out with us from Sportsman like on ESPN Radio 6 to 10 uh, Monday through Friday. Okay, now let's switch this over real quick. The Shohei Itani thing. Obviously, yeah. everyone understands, you know, the interpreter uh, allegedly stole $4.5 million from Shohei Itani and paid off a bookie. Uh, there's a smell to this thing in many different directions, and maybe there's no smell at all. Maybe I'm making up a smell. Evan, I don't know. This thing is weird, man. Give me your thoughts on it. It is. Um, let's try to go step by step in this one, right? So the way I look at this is let's, like, the same and dumb way I looked at Barry Bonds and Mark McGuire and all these other people that have had scandals around them different. I want to first believe him, like innocent until proven guilty. I thought the denial he gave yesterday, he being Otani, was a good one. Like, I felt like, okay, like he directly answered the question that everybody wanted to know. Did you bet on baseball? Where he did not answer, because there were no questions allowed, but what he did not um, answer was how did your translator get the information to your bank account. That's the part that I'm going to guess the two of you and others think smells on this, right? Mm -hmm. And you're right about that. But then Michelle Smallman on an unsportsman like our show brought up an interesting point. She said, don't we have to at least consider that this is someone that is not from the United States of America, doesn't speak our language, and has one person that he knows and trusts and probably had that person set up everything for him? And I said, yes, that makes some sense. Now, what we don't know then is, if that amount of money, guys, four and a half million dollars is removed from your bank account, would you notice that? But here, here is the fishiest thing of them all, okay? So you're saying it smells. I'm sure I've brought up some of the reasons you think it smells, Terry, but I'm going to go even further with one thing. The one thing that I don't understand is how in the world, if this is true, if this all happened, did the Dodgers deliver the message of how this happened to the entire team before delivering it to him? That, to me, is the biggest head-scratcher in all of this. For example, if, if hypothetically 
one of you had money stolen from you, and your boss decided to have a station meeting and let everyone know $45,000 has been stolen of Tyler's by Terry, and we're going to do it in front of the whole station before Tyler would know. That makes no sense. Since there's a part of this that seems to be missing. But I do want to believe Otani, just like I want to believe John T. Porter, the guy with the Raptors, didn't do this. I'm sorry. Blame me. I'm naive. I want to believe the good. Evan, you're not going along this business believing the good in people. Just saying. <laughs> just saying, brother. Hey, hey, man, we appreciate you. Let's get you back sometime. Can we get you back again We'd sometime? Love it. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Evan. We'll see you, man. Evan Cohen from Unsportsmanlike with Evan and Canty yeah. and Michelle, ESPN yeah. Radio I, 6 to 10 a.m. I, say, I, w- I wish we had enough money to have that much, yeah. even have the possibility of being stolen. Oh, I was us. like, man, I wish I had 45 grand to be stolen. I'd be happy. All right, we'll get back in here. Our uh, text of the hour, 803-404-6100 on the halftime show here on the game.
All right, time for our uh, text of the hour at 803-446-100. What do you got there, Tyler Head? Uh, yeah, so going back to our conversation about Misha Johnson transferring out, Nameless Texter weighs in and says, I worry our men's basketball program is getting to a point where if you can get any players that improve drastically, you're going to get picked off by large NIL colleges, especially a essentially a farm system. I wouldn't worry about that as much with basketball. I feel like if you want to be concerned about that with football, that's maybe a little bit more plausible. There are very few colleges around the country that put basketball on a super high pedestal pedestal when it comes to NIL stuff. Obviously, the Kansas, the Kentuckys, places right. like that. And there's so much talent across the board. You're talking about 300 some odd, uh, 363, I think, Division One yeah. teams. Or I don't feel like that is as high of a risk of of a thing happening here necessarily yeah i mean look you're always concerned about nil right i mean it's just human nature if you're not one of these big dog nil collectives or some school with deep pockets that can do all these you're know, just like making it rain sure you know like pac-man jones in the club if you're if you can't do that you're always concerned are you going to lose your really good players to those programs with better nil opportunities more money things of that nature but you're right for most of the country it's the NILs are, are really focusing more on football than basketball. Yes. Now, obviously, some of these schools have so much dough, they can focus on both in some way, shape, or form. But really, the top dog is football. And, I mean, so, I mean, do, an Ohio State's well, NIL game is starting to get better in general compared to what it was. How much sure. is that funnel well, of basketball? I really don't know at this point. I'm trying to think who would be – the highest earning theoretically NIL player in college, but men's college basketball right well, that's now. That's the other part. Here's the thing. And a lot, of, I think um, Lee brought this up in the first hour of the show. When we were talking about, you know, the difference in, in, in men's basketball today to what it used to be. One of the reasons the women's game has grown in popularity is the fact that these women stay for, their entire four years, pretty much, most of them. Caitlin Clark, I feel like she's been in Iowa for 10 years. Yeah, pretty much. You know, Aaliyah Boston was in South Carolina four years. Um, you know, Angel Reese, I'm guessing, will be at uh, we'll finish up four years. She started at Maryland yeah, and right. then went to LSU. Right. You know, you look at uh, Juju at Southern Cal. Mm -hmm. Good chance she'll be uh, a Trojan for four years. It just, they stay and you get used to them and you get that connection as a fan with them. Now, no one's saying the women's game is anywhere near as popular as the men's game. It's not. The men, by the way, had over 9 million on average watching the tournament so far, which I, is huge I, numbers this year. I, I think that North Carolina-Michigan State game peaked at like over 10 over yeah. the weekend. And the women, you know, their their high watermark was 2.2 million last year. Sure. So it's way better than it was. Yes, it's growing, but no one's trying to say because I'm hearing a lot of look. I get ESPN; they're carrying the women's games. Sure. That, so of course that is their tournament. That's their tournament. I get I get their agenda, and I get what they're trying to do. I understand, but make no mistake, the men's game. If you look at ratings and and attendance and all these other things, is still much more popular than the women's game. Sure. So, I mean, some of that's been gaining steam here lately when I hear the, these conversations. I'm like, no, no. Is the women's game more popular than it's ever been? Yes. Is it gaining traction? Yes. Is that great to see? Sure. But make no mistake, the men still have a much bigger audience and it's much more popular. Right. And that's not my opinion. That's fact. Look at the numbers. Which, because, again, it's a, it's a longstanding audience. Yes. There are a lot of people that have only recently come into women's basketball. But what's hurt the men, and going back to Lee's call in the first hour of the show about it, is that it's it's not the same anymore. You don't get to, you know, get to know a player. Like Armando Baycott is like an outlier yeah. at North Carolina. But Baycott, I mean, every Tar Heel fan knows Armando Baycott. And you know what? He I saw him in a commercial over the weekend. Exactly. And it was it was a it was a tax thing. It, yeah, it was yeah, like yeah. TurboTax tax or commercial. whatever. Which again, he's old enough to be filing taxes he, now. So Yeah, he's thirty five. So I mean but then the flip side is they brought the kid Ingram in from Stanford who's for the transfer portal. And, and he was huge sure. um, in the Michigan State game, uh, hitting a ton of threes. But he's a guy they're getting to know they like him because he's helping them win. But who are they going to have a warmer feeling in their heart for? Yeah. Armando Baycott, who's been there 10 years, or Harrison Ingram, who just showed up? And let's say Ingram goes off to the—I'm just making up stuff. Let's say he goes off to the NBA after one year. Let's say Carolina gets to a Final Four. Yeah, people will remember Ingram's contribution to the, get to that Final Four— 
but the feeling for Ingram would be nowhere near what the feeling is for Armando Baycott. Right, because he put in the years and years building up to it to get to that point. Just like R.J. Davis in sure. North Carolina. So stuff like that doesn't happen that much anymore. I mean, you know, Kentucky just churns them through. Heck, they, Kentucky fans well, don't even know the names of those players. I was going to say, and that's led to their downfall of why they keep getting bounced early in tournaments because they go up against a team like Oakland that has a bunch of 30-year-olds that have played a ton of college basketball. And, yeah, these one-and-done kids are very, very talented, but sometimes experience wins out. Again, that 35-year-old accountant cracked 10 threes for Oakland. He did. So, yeah, it's – it's just different, it, it, and the connection isn't there like it used to be because it's become so nomadic. But the, the the good thing for the women's game is because the WNBA doesn't pay tons and tons of money, some of them can make more staying in college with NIL. That's right. So just saying. All right, we'll see what's trending at 2 next here on the Halftime Show on the game.
All right, what's trending at two here on the halftime show in the game? Terry Ford, Tyler Head. What's trending um, in the NFL that we didn't get to last hour is the new kickoff rules that they are going to put into play, which I like this. I do too. I, I saw a lot of people complaining, and it's like, well, you can either have this or have 98% touchbacks like we've been doing for the past 10 years. I mean, and I forget the name of this executive, but when Roger Goodell gave his state of the sport address part of the Super Bowl, th this guy came up before and said, yeah, the kickoff's a dead ceremonial play. Like, we do it because it's always been a part of the game, but it serves no purpose right now. Right. It's awful. I'd rather see action on kickoffs. I get about the, you know, again, player safety. I know the NFL says that while they're winking at you. Oh, yeah, while they're, while they're adding a, uh, a 17th game. Exactly. While they're playing on Thursday nights, mm -hmm. which is about a 100-hour turnaround time between games, while, you know, injuries are up more than ever in a lot of in a lot of different areas. Like, yeah, they're very hypocritical when it comes to that. They, I wish they would just say this. We're doing this because we don't want to get sued. Pretty much. Because that's really all they're doing. Because they started caring about player safety when players lined up in courtrooms all through New York City to sue them. I was going to say, uh, around 2010, they went, oh, concussions are bad. Oh, yeah, did you ever we should see do something about that. Did you ever see the PBS Frontline documentary I on, did the not. Concussion, on the concussion deal, the CTE and the concussions? I did not. According to the documentary, the NFL basically was telling players, oh, your head's okay. Everything's okay. Well, you remember You're they right. they wouldn't let Junior Seau's family speak at his Hall of Fame introduction because they were afraid they were going to say something, you know, bad about the NFL and make it look bad from a PR standpoint. Oh, it's just, it's hilarious how they just basically pushed head injuries under a rug for years until they couldn't anymore. And they didn't want to get sued. So you know what we care about now? Not getting sued. I, I, mean, I mean, player safety, my bad. We care about player safety. Sorry, we slipped. So... A lot of things got basically shut down because that's what everyone does. They go from one extreme to the other. Well, that's why we have a new, and we can get to this in a minute, a new rule every single year that's uh, only further handcuffing defensive players. Sure. And at the end of the day, like some of the rules on, de on defensive players, like like the launching yourself as a weapon, I get that. You don't want some human spear coming helmet first at people because the defender typically is the one that gets hurt. Right. But. That being said, the ridiculousness of some of these these calls for leading with your head. Launching is one thing. If I'm okay, I'm trying to tackle you, right? Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Are you going to let me? No. So if I'm coming at you to hit you, what are you going to typically try to do? Uh, try to avoid you. Or are you going to say this to me? Or or move my body in a way where you can't tackle me. Are, are you going to say this? Hey, gee, I want to stay still now because I don't <laughs> want you to um, hit me with your head. I once heard, and I've always uh, brought this up anytime we talk about tackling, I heard somebody once say years and years ago that trying to perfect a tackle in the NFL is like trying to choreograph a car crash. Yes. You've got too many independent variables happening at the same time where it's never going to be pristine. Sometimes helmets hit each other, and at 95% of the time, it's without malicious content. And that's my problem with a lot of this. Like, the, like, you know, and we'll get to the tackling thing here in a second, obviously, because that's also been a thing at the owners' meetings. But the kickoff, basically what's going to happen is this. The kicker will continue to kick the ball off from the 35-yard line. The other 10 players in the kickoff team will line up at the receiving team's 40-yard line. At least nine members of the return team will line up in a setup zone between the 35 and 30-yard lines. Up to two returners will line up in a landing zone between the goal line and the 20-yard line. I know this sounds like uh, an airport. It, I know. But you, you've probably seen the XFL kickoff, which is essentially what this same is. Same type of thing, exactly. For me, now you get the chance of a real return, yes. and you're not getting people tearing down the field 30 miles an hour at each other it, to cause the car crashes that you're talking about. When I saw the XFL do this for the first time, I immediately said the NFL needs to do something similar to that if they want the kickoff to continue in the NFL. I never thought, because the NFL never likes to take from other leagues. They want to be the innovator and the leader at all steps in the process of professional football. So the fact that they looked at what is essentially a developmental league and said, wow, they're doing kickoffs better than us. Let's implement that, is yeah. 
amazing. I can't believe they actually, because typically the NFL won't steal from other leagues. They followed him for that two-point conversion years and years and years ago. Sure, and they stole the spider cam from the XFL. But Which, that's by it. the way, the best thing from the XFL. Yes. That and he hate me. Oh, you, um, you didn't like the scramble instead of the, uh, the coin toss? Okay, I like that too. I forgot about that. Thanks for reminding me. Um, so, you know, I'm stunned the NFL took something from some other league. Yes. The one thing I want them to do, and they just won't do it, you think the kickoff is a dead play? How about the onside kick? Ooh, that and that that is the unfortunate victim of this, is the onside kick. I mean, the onside kick, forget a dead play. It's been buried. It has a tombstone. It has its own coffin. <laughs> Uh, what was the rule change they made a couple years ago that spiked the percentages back in favor of the kicking team again? Oh, jeez, I can't remember. I think it's with uh, the amount of guys you had lined up on one side. Yeah, I think I th- yeah, I think you're right. Because it went from like, and again, the kicking team's always going to be more successful, but I mm-hmm. think it was like maybe like a 70-30. Now I it's mean, like 95 I mean, everything. The ball goes out of bounds. Who's it? Who's it? Uh, yeah, it goes back to the kicking team. I mean, you Gotta know, go 10 yards. I mean, if it doesn't, it rolls 10 yards and... Again, it's got to go 10, and everything goes to the kick, goes to the to team recovering it. Yeah. So the team recovering it, they get the ball, goes out of bounds, they get the ball. It's got to go 10 yards, nobody can touch it. And really, they have to touch it first, remember, if the sure. kicking team can't touch it. So, again, advantage team receiving the onside kick. The onside kick is such a blah play. And the NFL, remember, they had to make the extra point more exciting. Which I think that's one of the best rule changes they and ever I, made. I'll raise my hand. I thought it was dumb. It's a great change. It's phenomenal. I am you're on actually, board. You're actually watching the extra point now. I was wrong. I used to get up and go to the bathroom on the extra point. Now I actually watch it. It's so affecting NFL, games. Good job. You were right. I was wrong. But please, for the, for the love of everything that matters in the NFL... Get rid of the onside kick and go to, I forget what spring league did it. You get the ball on the 25-yard line, and it's fourth and 10. So that proposal's been brought up and a couple different times, and they keep knocking it down because now with this new kickoff rule, if you want to do an, uh, uh, an onside kick, you have to let the other team know, which most of the time the other team's going to know, and they're yeah. going to line up accordingly. Yeah. But the element of surprise you know, Sean Payton in the second half of the Super Bowl against, you know, mm-hmm. uh, Indianapolis. Like, that is essentially gone, which, again, that didn't happen in every single game. But at least having that in your back pocket was good to know. Like, hey, we feel like we can get something here and steal a possession. Let's go ahead and do it. Um, now, essentially, if you're down in the fourth quarter trying to get an extra score, you have to tell the other team, hey, we're going to onside kick it. We're again, and I don't believe they've changed any of the rules about the teams lining up. Uh, differently, it's still going to 95% of the time uh, end up going to the other team. And and that's an end of game scenario. Just go to the fourth and 10 from the 25 yard line. Yep. Please. That's fun, right? That's exciting. You're basically running a fourth down play to keep the ball, keep possession and go down the field. Instead, we do this onside kick. That is what? Unsuccessful 97.223575% of the time or 90 some percent of the time, whatever it is. Sure. Please. You, you, you made the extra point exciting. Yeah. Make the onside kick, get rid of it, and have an exciting play. I forget what Spring League did it, but it was phenomenal. Yeah, one of them did it. And, again, this is – I think it was the um, the Alliance of American Football because they didn't have kickoffs right. back then, So um, which that league didn't even last a full year. Um, but, yeah, a, a lot of these Spring Leagues always come in, which now that we have one with the UFL, which I think starts this weekend – um, you know, they all come in with these different ideas and different concepts on how to do a variety of things, and some of them are better than what the NFL does. I just never thought I'd see the day where the NFL said, yeah, that league that's below us, they do this better than us. Let's go ahead and implement that, but um, I'm here for it. Again, it's either this or just continue to watch the kickoff become 95% touchbacks with the occasional, you know, return. And, and to me, because I've always wondered about this, and going back to your Um, comment about moving the extra point back a couple years ago I've legitimately wondered like how much are special teams coordinators doing in the NFL now and how devalued has that position become with the lack of kickoffs this adds way more to that job now and I'd love to hear like Joe D. Camillus's thoughts if we ever get to talk to him anytime soon about how much this changes the game from a coaching standpoint now that you have a play that's going to be happening more often than not again and the other thing, real quick, as we were uh, rolling what's trending at two, um, sponsored by our buddies at Atlantic Windows and Doors, the NFL banned the hip drop tackle. Now, uh, the Players Association's not happy. Sure. At all. Defensive players are like, seriously? Really? 
Now, the hip drop tackle, like Mark Andrews, the Ravens got hurt. There have been mm -hmm. players who have been getting hurt when tackled like this. And I understand the idea you don't want you don't want a tackle that's going to end up in injury or sure. increase the ability of injury. Unless you're tackling a guy that's not that good, then the NFL doesn't care. Right. But I understand it. But again, I always go back to the you're, you're well, running on the field as a player, a defensive player, and you're trying to grab a dude and make a tackle. Yeah. I, I don't think that tackle is ever really premeditated, or very that, rarely would it be premeditated. That's what I was going to say is, okay, well, I'm running this guy down from behind. When As I grab him around the waist, I'm going to sink my hips to one side or the other to make sure that I drag his leg underneath me so I can bend him backwards like a pretzel and mm -hmm. take him down. That is not the thought process when making a tackle. I'm going to grab, put my arms around him and hope for the best and try and bring him to the ground. Like it, It's happening in a split second right. as well, and that's what bothers me so much about rule changes in the NFL is, yes, there's a competition committee where you have coaches and stuff like that on it, but you have so many people involved with the process of making rule changes that have never suited up more than a peewee football game in their life. They don't understand the processes of being on the field and understanding these things happen in fractions of seconds where you can't suddenly contort your body a certain way when running at full speed trying to tackle somebody else. And you can't do Keanu Reeves from the Matrix. You can't when you're no. when you're sacking a quarterback. You can't levitate above them to not put your full body weight to on. To me, them. that's the dumbest rule change of all the rule changes. That look again, common sense. You know when a you're sitting there watching this as an official. You know if a defensive player is flopping on a quarterback to sure. inflict bodily N harm. Nagdama sue guys like that yeah. put their whole body weight Tony into the Sarah upper body. Tony Saragusa, sure. the AFC Championship game in 2000, or Rich Gannon. Exactly, but 99 percent of the time they're just tackling them and they fall that way that's it because you know what happens when you tackle somebody sometimes tyler you're if, usually going to fall on top fall of them. On them yeah so that's a just a just a rule that's been taken to the stu stupidity of the extreme now i get the horse collar that's dangerous man sure yeah 15 yard on that baby absolutely i get it i mean i get like again you want to stop players from launching themselves as weapons and human missiles and projectiles i get it right yeah i understand but there's a difference between that and a guy trying to tackle a dude and the dude's trying to juke him and the guy's helmet ends up, well, you know, going helmet to helmet with him because they're it, both trying to achieve something. And, and this is where, because, again, now you're putting it in the hands of the officials because it's going to be a 15-yard penalty and an automatic first down, which don't get me started on automatic first downs. Those bug, bug me, too, when it's less than the amount of yards you would gain anyway. But now you're putting it in the hands of the officials to, and this isn't going to be reviewable because, of course not, where you say, okay, well, it kind of looked like he dropped his hips on that tackle. Uh, all right, that's flag. And then you go back and look at it and you say, well, actually, he didn't. It just looked that way when he tackled him. So, so now you're giving them another line of subjectivity to judge tackling on, which is going to lead to more 15-yard penalties, slow the game down even more, and just create a bigger mess. And by the way, um, trying to figure this out in full speed in oh, real yeah. time. And look, I get officials have hard jobs because you're watching the best athletes mm -hmm. in the world run at each other at full speed and have to make a split-second decision when you can't review these things. So guess what? They're going to err on the side of caution, which means they're going to throw more flags. Right, and that's why I always say, going back to this, don't increase the number of challenges. Open up more things you can challenge. Sure. G give a team a set allotment of challenges in a game. You have three challenges you can use if you want to review the extra point. You can do That's it. Right. You're probably not going to win, but you right. can do it, and you, that is it. Right, and that's me. I, everybody goes, oh, if you open up this, you're going to slow the game. No, I'm not. Yeah. So I'm not increasing challenges. What I'm doing is giving you more things you can yes. challenge, but hey, I'm not increasing hey, the number I of challenges. I don't think my defensive back uh, forced pass interference. Look at the replay. Nope, he didn't get there first. Exactly. Yeah, the receiver caught the ball, and then he hit him. Like, exactly. Boom, and then it's overturned. Yep. All right, we'll get back here on the halftime show. Very nice weekend for Gamecock baseball against Vanderbilt. By the way, Gamecock baseball tonight here on the game in Columbia and Myrtle Beach. We'll get into that as well. But let's review and rewind some of the sound from the people who helped sweep Vanderbilt over the weekend for Gamecock Baseball. That's next. Halftime show. Terry Ford, Tyler Head on the game.
All right, halftime show. What's trending at two? Terry Ford and Tyler Head here on the game. Do not forget tonight. Again, I believe six fifteen pregame. That is correct. Six thirty uh, first pitch. South Carolina going at it uh, tonight. Again, you can hear that on the game. Again, the weekend series is Thursday, Friday, Saturday against Alabama this week, and we'll be having the women's Sweet Sixteen game. Four thirty pre five o'clock tip. Friday on our sister station, 985 WOMG. All that sound good? Sounds great. We miss anything? Uh, I don't think so. Not this time, but I will at some point. Trust me. That's the only two sports we got left. Yes, for right now. All right. um, Obviously, a good weekend for Gamecock baseball. Sweep of Vanderbilt. Going into it, we didn't talk about a ton because we had the, the men's NCAA tournament, the women's tournament. Everything was kicking in. Spring practice. That was an important series, Tyler, just to just to, for nothing else to give you confidence. You can go out there and play against real competition and be mm-hmm. successful because they were going when I see it, uh, oh, one and four yeah. against well, real competition. I would venture to say it was uh, almost a must win series because when you talk about how competitive the SEC is and just about every team in the SEC is in the D1 baseball top 25 and rightfully so you fall two series behind and start off the year 0-2 as far as series goes, you're going to have a tough time clawing out of that, going on the road to Tuscaloosa in week number three, potentially looking at starting the, ser- the season 0-3 for seasons in the or series in the SEC. That's detrimental, and you couldn't afford that. And one of the things that have been hurting South Carolina this year has been the lack of consistency on offense. They've been walking a ton, getting a bunch of dudes on base, just couldn't knock them in. Right. It's been an issue. Well, Mark Kingston talked about making some lineup adjustments. Well, you know, I think communication is the key. You've got to talk to guys individually if you're going to be moving them in a lineup. You know, you're going to have to talk to them if you're moving them in or out of a lineup. You're going to have to talk to them if you have decided to platoon at a certain position. You've got to communicate. Um, so it starts with that so they kind of know what to expect before you put out the lineup each day. Um, you have to get their feedback. You know, if a guy likes – hitting in a certain spot in the order, you need to know that. If he doesn't care where he moves in the lineup, you need to know that as well. Uh, So I think the communication from player to coach is very, very important. Um, We encourage it. We initiate it. And I like to know uh, if I think I have an idea on something that can spark the lineup, I want to make sure that the guys will be on board with it, uh, that we'll be a part of that uh, shift. So, again, I think we've got to talk about those things with our guys all the time. Uh, as coaches, we talk all the time about things we need to do to help our players. Um, what do we need to do more of? What do we need to do less of? What do we need to talk about? What do we need to not uh, belabor? Uh, so it's always it's always a work in progress, especially as we talk about it all the time, the, the, the age of the transfer portal. You may not figure out your team quite as quickly as you have in the past because there's so many moving pieces. There's so many new pieces to the puzzle. And so it's just a constant evaluation of where you are, what you can improve, what needs to stabilize, and then just try to make educated decisions as you go. A very interesting point by uh, Mark about the the transfer portal. It, it takes you a little bit longer sometimes to evaluate because you got all these pieces moving in and out, and guys aren't – all here for two, three, four years to where you kind of know what you got going in. Yeah, it certainly takes some time to work the kinks out. And I think case in point, you looked at it where I think maybe we thought that Blake Jackson was maybe going to be the guy at the beginning of the season. It turned out to be Kennedy Jones, who um, was leading the team in batting average going into the weekend, got passed by Dylan Brewer over the weekend. But, yeah, it can take a little bit of time to kind of feel some of these guys out. Obviously, talk about Parker Nolan, you know, being at the top of your lineup here as of late and, you know, kind of feeling him out, um, you know, in one of those higher roles on your uh, on your lineup. But it seems like this team, now that we're almost two months into the season, right at two months into the season, um, uh, are finally starting to settle in a little bit. And, and, you know, again, when Ethan Petri has a good game or Messina has a good game, it feels like it all brings well, everything into place. I was going to say, that's your two and your four hitter. Typically, if those guys are doing well, got that going, resonates man. with – and that was the problem going back to the previous weekend series against Ole Miss. I think back at that first game, top lineup did not do anything. And Ethan Petri had the home run on Saturday, but his weekend overall wasn't all that great. Comasina went, went over for the entire weekend, like, and it showed. And yeah, they were able to win that last game, but you still lost the series. So when your two preseason All Americans aren't playing well, that usually has an effect on the rest of the team. All right. Uh, also, the pitching, which has been has been good this year for the most part, held their own against Vandy in the three game series. Here's uh, Coach Kingston 
evaluating the weekend starters? Well, we're going to continue to uh, evaluate everything as we go. Um, but one thing I do know is that uh, we basically have, if, if you're looking at Pitzer, SQ, and Jones as your weekend starters, those guys are all sinker ballers with good velocity, but sinker ballers. And what you hope is that they can get a lot of quick outs, uh, a lot of ground balls, and then you hand the ball off to your bullpen, and it's a lot of strikeout guys. And Good is a strikeout guy, and Beach is a strikeout guy, and Becker is a strikeout guy, and Ganey's a strikeout guy, and, and on and on. And so, ideally, that's a really nice way to set up the pitching staff because you want strikeout guys for the last three to four innings of a ball game because that's when it takes some bad luck out of the equation for you. So if you're striking out over a guy an inning, that's only two outs that, that a team has to work with in terms of a, a, a bloop being able to fall in against you or a ground ball having eyes getting through. So, you know, ideally you have your sinker ball guys starting game, getting you to the fifth or sixth, and then you hand it over to your strikeout guys where you can minimize bad luck against you. So, um, that's kind of a way we like to do it, but everything is always under consideration as we go because if we think there's a way to make things better, we'll always look at that as well. And that's the one thing about this team. It's like there seems to be a lot of interesting options when it comes to starting pitching. Sure. And there's it feels like there's depth there. Again, some guys are better than others, obviously, but you feel like you have depth. Remember last year, when you're starting pitching, everybody got hurt. Yep. And then you had some other issues as well. You really, Jack Mahoney was like last man standing when he, it was all said he, and done. He was the only of the original starting three rotation to still have that same spot at the end of the season. And, you know, you were trying to piece things in, and Matthew Becker and Eli Jones and these guys and here and there, and not to say they didn't, you know, do a solid job, but you, you really had a fall off from what you were hoping you were going to have to where you ended up. Right. This year, it feels like you've got depth and a bunch of guys who are, it's not like you're falling off the cliff or you're really like, oh, wow, we thought we had this, now we've got to do this. I think Mark, I think Mark has a bunch of different interesting pieces to play with. Well, and you talked about bringing guys from the transfer portal and kind of figuring out where everybody's going to slot in, in addition to bringing in true freshmen. That's why I think you kind of looked at these past couple of weekend series and had TBD as far as your Sunday guy goes, saying, okay, well, let's see what we use through games number one and two and see what we have left when Saturday, when uh, Sunday rolls around and, and decide to go from there. As we've seen uh, what Roman Kimball, we've seen Ty Good, now we've seen Tyler Pitzer get starts in those respective games. So, And Pitzer was a guy that was coming out of the bullpen much like Ty Good was, and both those guys had really good stuff, mm -hmm. but I think Pitzer with that performance on Sunday against the number three team in the country Pretty may, nice. have, may have locked up his third his uh, his roles that third starter. Absolutely. Let's switch gears. What's trending at two here on the game? And let's hit uh, Shane Beamer with his presser earlier um, uh, about 1230 today. Uh, Shane talking about Juju McDowell's injury. Hit that real quick, Tyler. Uh, really, the only new addition, David, would be uh, Juju McDowell. He'll probably not probably he will be done um, for the spring. It's nothing. Um, long term it was something a collarbone that's been bothering him a little bit that he fell on not in a contact drill but diving for a ball to catch a pass and uh, kind of came down on the wrong way and it was a situation where we said do we want to continue to have this thing nag him and, and be an issue or do we want to go ahead and, and get it fixed and we he and all of us agreed let's just go ahead and get it fixed where it's not an issue going forward so he will uh um, he'll have a procedure done to get that mended up, and uh, he's not excited about it, but that's what he wants to do, and uh, he'll be good to go uh, here shortly. Won't be able to do anything else the rest of practice, but uh, he's a guy. He's played a lot of football around here, and we, uh, we know what he can do. Yeah, I mean, get Juju McDowell healthy. You know what he can do. Yeah. He's been here for a while now. You know his skill set, his strengths, what he can do to help you offensively. Just get him better and get him ready for when it matters, right? Right. That's really where you're at. All right. Uh, and, of course, there'll be more Shane Beamer on uh, on the uh, postgame show with uh, Jay and Elijah as well. All right. Uh, a couple tickets, two pair of tickets. Callers number five and six for when, Tyler? Once again, baseball next weekend against Texas A&M. Callers five and six, 803-404-6100. You get uh, tickets for next weekend against A&M. Halftime show, Terry Ford, Tyler Head. We're rolling until three here on the game.
803-875-MENS. That's the number for the Men's Clinic of South Carolina. You just, we talk about it all the time. And I know you're thinking about it, but you won't do it. Because that's what happens with a lot of guys. Okay, I'm not sleeping well. I have a lack of, lack of life drive, professional drive, sex drive, personal drive. You name the drive, I don't have it anymore. I'm not sleeping well. My workouts stink. My bounce back from workouts stink worse than my workouts. I can't remember where I sit anything anymore. Heck, I can't remember the right house to go to. Do I have dementia? Oh, my God. Maybe it's just low testosterone. It's very simple. One way to find out. You call 803-875-MENS. Men's Clinic of South Carolina. You set up a free consultation. It's confidential. You tell them your story. If they think it could be low testosterone, they'll set some lab work up for you. If it is low T, they'll put you on a program personalized and specialized for you. It's the Men's Clinic of South Carolina, 803-875-MENS. Make the call. If nothing else, get peace of mind. It could just be low T.
All right, time to check the greatest day in the history of the world, March 26th. Sponsored by 1 800 Got Junk. All right, 1974. George Foreman. Now, this isn't the guy with the with the George Foreman grill and he's smiling and he's got, you know, George 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This was a mean, angry man who wanted to end people's lives. Yeah. In 1974, George Foreman, the heavyweight champion, knocks out Ken Norton in the second round in Caracas, Venezuela. Ken Norton was really good. Beat Muhammad Ali in Yankee Stadium in a non title fight. Mm -hmm. Ken Norton was good. George Foreman was a beast back in, uh, when he first had the title until Muhammad Ali beat George Foreman. Right. So Foreman knocks out Ken Norton in the second round in Venezuela in 1974. 1994, uh, Utah point guard John Stockton becomes the second player in NBA history to collect 2,000 career steals. Also, Stockton becomes the player wearing the shortest shorts ever to collect 2,000 <laughs> career steals. What year did you say that was? Uh, that year was 1994. See, I thought the shorts were starting to get longer by then. Might have been. But I think it, I think the Utah Jazz held out. Because, like, I've seen way too many pictures of Bill Walton in far too short shorts from back in the day. And, like, I get it. That's how basketball was. But um, then we got to, what, the early 2000s where the bottom of the shorts were touching your tops of your shoes. And yeah. it's like, all right, that let's got, find a good middle ground. And I feel like we're, we finally established that middle ground. Yeah, it got a bit much. It got a bit much there with the long, long shorts. They were almost like man capris. Exactly. They yeah. weren't shorts. Well, and I think about it from the standpoint of, like, that's heavy. Running up and down the court with those on, like, you want something a little bit light and breezy to, to be able to, you know, move a little swiftly, right? Yeah, don't want your shorts to cover your knees. No. It's Just not say. A, not a good idea. Not a great idea. All right, and one last uh, uh, greatest day in the history of the world this day, 2006. George Mason stuns number one seed UConn. In overtime, 86-84, to become the first 11 seed to reach the men's Final Four since LSU in 1986. Dale Brown squad got to the Final Four as an 11 seed. That George Mason team was cool, too. They had a guy who was a former, like, paratrooper. He was, like, 25 years old. His name escapes me. Right. Jim Laranega coached that team. Of course, now he's at the University of Miami where he made a Final Four. It, that was fun. And what's so cool about when teams like George Mason, you know, VCU, Wichita State, or, you know, ones that just make the big upset like Oakland. Like, they really cement themselves into the history of March Madness where years and years go by, and that team, that program may not do anything even close to relevant to what they did, you know, that year back in 2006, but you're always saying, George Mason, remember them back in 06? Like, you cement your legacy in the history of March Madness when you do those kind of things. Think about it for a minute. Um, if I asked you your memories, not, not about your favorite team, but your memories as, as a college basketball fan or a fan that watches the NCAA tournament, yeah. Um, a lot of the times the first memories are ready. Who, who won the national championship five years ago? I don't know, but I remember Butler's back-to-back -back run to the Final Four. I was going to say, it's the upsets. It, it's the underdog mm -hmm. stories, the Cinderella's, yes. all that kind of stuff. I, I remember very vividly, and I did end up going to Georgia State, but when Georgia State uh, upset was that – was that Duke in the in the first round, if I remember correctly? I think it was the fifth, 14 or 15 tournament mm -hmm. where uh, uh, Ron Hunter was Ron on Hunter. the little uh Remember, he said he had his chair. leg. He was yeah. in a um, cast or whatever. He broke his leg, and his son hit the game-winning shot. Yeah, and he falls over, and they had the bobblehead of him falling over. Like, that. that is one of my favorite college basketball memories. Yes. I mean, that's the stuff we remember. Yeah, we remember great teams like undefeated UNLV or Duke going to four straight Final Fours with Christian Leitner. That stuff, yeah. But the things that you typically come to your mind first are the Cinderella's. Sure. That's what's really cool. Like, like we'll always remember Florida Atlantic's run last year to the Final Four as a, what, a nine seed, I believe they were. Right. We always remember. That's why, ready, hey, college basketball, hey, schools, hey, conferences, hey, commissioners. It was Baylor, not Duke. Baylor. Baylor. Yes. There you go. Don't st don't just add more of your blah, mediocre Power 5 teams that nobody cares about. The Cinderella's will make this tournament special from the smaller conferences. Right. Do not push them out. You'd be screwing up your tournament. But you'd never do anything for money. No. No. Not at all. all right, that's the greatest day in the history of the world. Sponsored by 1-800-GOT-JUNK. Real quick, Shane Beamer, uh, his presser today, obviously spring practice going on in Carolina. Shane talked about a, a few different things. Another one, let's, uh, let's take a look at cut six. Uh, about the running back room and also a running back we don't talk about. A guy who was a four-star recruit last year, burned his red shirt because he have, came Cox needed him, DJ Braswell and the rest of the running backs. Here's Shane uh, talking about those cats. Yeah, uh, he came in as a true freshman and did some things. Y'all heard me talk about it. The game-winning touchdown pass against Kentucky was 
made possible because of a great blitz pickup that he made where he had to come across the formation and pick up a linebacker or a, a guy coming on the pressure, which is big for a um, for any running back to do, but especially a true freshman. I think with DJ, it was very much, you know, we tell our, I told the running backs <clears throat> back in January that, look, yeah, we brought in three transfer running backs, talking to Juju and DJ and all those returning guys, and that's not necessarily a knock on you, but that is a opportunity. One, we showed last year with all the injuries we had at running back that you need more than three scholarship running backs. I told you guys before, I was at Virginia Tech and we lost four in one season. Uh, back in 2014 or 15 and uh, 14. Uh, so we want to increase the depth, but also it's time for DJ or whoever else to, to step up as well. And I think he took that to heart that, okay, you brought in three running backs. I'm going to work and he's got a ways to go, but he worked in the weight room. He's, he can run. There's no question about it. He continues to get stronger and then being able to do all the things that we want our running backs to do. It's not just running the ball. It's all the other stuff, protections, passing game, all uh, and special teams. And uh, he's continuing to get better. So that's a, another great room with competition. Love what Oscar brings to the table. Love what Rocket brings to the table. Really excited about Jawarn Howe. And then to go along with Juju and DJ and Bradley Dunn and Chase McCracken, Nathan Harris Wayne, and some of the other running backs that we have here in the program. It's a good group. I mean, it's a deep group. They got a deep running back room. Last year, remember, I mean, God, God loved to carry on Jordan had to be the starting running back last year. Uh, you know, you know, you had your division, your division two guy, Mario Anderson, ended up being your most effective running back. Sure. You know, you had to burn DJ Braswell's red shirt because of injuries. Juju McDowell got hurt. This year, it's just a deeper room. Yeah. It's a deeper room in the spring because, again, last spring, DeKaron Jordan got moved to running back, and we thought, ah, it's a temporary thing. He's just filling a, a, a space in the room until they can go out there and get another running back in the transfer portal. Well, lo and behold, they weren't able to get another running back in the transfer portal. So when the season rolled around, guess what? DeKaron Jordan was running back. And, again, he tried his best, but yeah. that was his natural position. And yeah. learning a new spot in year number five of your college mm -hmm. career, six, whatever it was, is exactly the easiest thing to do. I always give DeKaron Jordan props for – just whatever whatever needed to be done. Sure. He would step up and give it a whirl. I'll Absolutely. Say, that's the kind of guy that we go back to talking about in our conversation a little bit earlier on are going to be a little bit more few and far between, you know, with the advent of the transfer portal and stuff like that. But he'll be forever loved as a Gamecock and staying committed mm -hmm. even through two different coaching regimes. Well, think about it. when he had the big Mayo Bowl, he could have taken off and see if he could start somewhere at quarterback. Sure. Because it wasn't going to be uh, here, but he stayed. He hung out He because uh, he loved playing at South Carolina. Yes, those stories, we, we're not going to hear as many of those as uh, you used to. You know what? Not. When you do hear them, it makes it special. Oh, yeah, and look, no one's dogging the, the – it's just the world we're in now. Right. It's just the world we're in. All right, we'll come back in here. Our uh, text of the hour at 803-446-100. We'll uh, yip with our buddy Jay Phillips as well, see what's going on. I got a story for both of you from oh. my weekend. Okay. Halftime show. Terry Ford, Tyler Head, you're on the game.
Jay Phillips hanging out with us. Tyler Head, Elijah Campbell coming in. Post game show with Jay here in just a few minutes here on the game. All right, I got a story for for you, you both of you that happened over the weekend. But before, give us the old uh, text of the hour at 803-404-6100. Yeah, so going back to the conversation, obviously, about Michi Johnson transferring out, um, which I believe that broke while Jay and uh, Elijah were on the air yesterday. Yep. I dove into that a little bit. But um, talk about the NIL aspect of it. Name is Texture Ways, and it says NIL will affect sports in a negative way. At some point, fans are the ones uh, being left out of all this, donors still paying scholarships for kids making millions. I don't, they don't know if there's anybody in college basketball making millions. Uh, there's some guys making some good NIL, but as we've talked about, that that lack of superstar in today's college basketball game, I, I don't think it's as uh, tilted as college football yeah, is. Like I said, there's not a whole lot of Armando Baycotts. I think right now, I, you know, I would, I would venture to say, and I don't know how many of them are disclosed, but I would think Caitlin Clark might actually – currently be the highest paid collegiate athlete has to be uh, she has to. in all of sports yeah, in collegiate i don't know i mean I, I, at least certainly now, one of, i mean look like last year Leah boston made nine hundred thousand dollars i South Carolina. I, th I think last year livy dunn might have actually been number one i, was but yeah. I imagine caitlin clark but is she making, her run for now money. she's making a lot of money separately right right yeah through like, but it is through what she it, does it is through yeah. being a gymnast yeah. so but I mean, but I guess they, Caitlin's they, being paid through they, being a basketball. They, they, they might be one and two. Well, honestly. Livy Dunn, yeah. Now, and Livy Dunn is making; she's making right. a lot of money. I know the Cavender yeah. twins made a lot of yeah. money, but they had their YouTube channel and they get hey, a lot of subscribers. They're and, professional wrestlers now. I know, Did you know that. There you yeah. go. How about that? Crazy. Uh, craziness. <laughs> <laughs> now, when do they wrestle? Um, um, the Rock and Reigns. No, oh, they're not in the When's main event coming? scene just yet. Okay. Can you save that text for me, though, please? Because I would like to sure. use that because yeah. um, I know we don't have time here. I would like to comment on that, and I know I will, because I do think there are a lot of things going around right now that may not directly apply yeah. to young Mr. Johnson. Yeah, I think that we always automatically go to NIL because that's what a lot of this is, and sometimes it isn't. And with Michi Johnson, part of it is going back home. Part of it is being back in front of family yeah. and things of that nature. I, I'm, I'm not sure any of it is NIL when it comes to Michi, and it might uh, not based be. on the conversations that I've had today. And, and obviously everywhere everyone goes first is always NIL today. Yeah. It's just human nature. Yeah. Got a story for you guys. So I'm in D.C. over the weekend, and my, my kid's doing the, the, the college tour because, you know, he's in sixth grade and we got to get prepared. Yeah. Boy, this is today. Of course. So he goes to see American no, tell University. people the truth. He's, he's a junior, A junior right? in yeah, high school. Okay, yeah, yeah. So we're at American University in D.C. And we do the whole tour thing and we're finishing up and then we do the gift shop where I shoplift a, a hoodie. Yeah. It's kind of a tradition. And so we're getting in the car and leaving. You know how these big, you've been in enough of these, uh, the, the big, like, underground parking garage with the big pillars sure, right sure and you get like three cars per between pillars yes well we're sitting there and i'm in we're in the 72 pinto that we have and then there's a guy who was Fine part vehicle. of our tour well you know it explodes it's kind of fun and the guy there's a there was a family that was in our tour as well and they're getting in their vehicle and so we're getting in ours and all of a sudden you're just boom Your like pinto a gun went off. off and i thought it was the pinto no, I look over, and this guy had pulled out too close to the column oh, no. and wiped out his mirror no. and the entire side of his car, no. and I saved the best for last. You know what he was driving? Tesla. Oh, oh no. no. Dude, well, those things drive themselves. Well, Elon Musk showed so up, smacked him twice is in that the what, face. I mean, do you want to yeah. blame it on that, right? Well, I mean, I mean I'm figuring you got 50, you got more camera angles than Steven Spielberg in a movie, right, in a Tesla, I'm guessing. It's almost like, you know, how can you do that? I was like, I, and the whole family's just standing around the car like it's dead. They're just standing there going, wow, uh, shame what happened uh, to the Tesla. Yeah, it's awful. Hope it was under, well, I guess that's that's really not a warranty thing. Hey, that's I get that's it. an insurance thing. Yeah. Well, my, my, my son said, Dad, if they can afford a Tesla, they can afford another one. <laughs> I was like, that's eh, fair. That's fair. That's that's fair. But it did. I mean, he tore that thing up. Yeah. I don't know why he did what he did, why he backed up so fast, and I don't know what the deal was. There was no cars next to him. Right. So he, he could just take it his time and backed it on out of there real slow and it was good. But instead, See, that thing. What uh, what do these? Up. I don't I don't I know I know a couple people that have one. But what what is a car like that? You know, ballpark retail. It depends. There's the Tesla well, that like like it, teachers buy, and then there's the real fancy level one Tesla. I was right, gonna say, and, and yeah, th there's different types of it. This was a level one. I don't by even the way. know if you can get like routine body work done on them, or if you just have to like buy a whole new one. Like I'm not. I've I, never seen one get wrecked. I'll before. say this. This one, 
was one of the ones that, you know, had the doors doing all the things, and if you hit a button, it, it can, like, cook food, and, you know, it turns into a boat. I mean, this was a high-level Tesla. Man. I was going to say, you can change, like, the horn to sound like a <laughs> sound, you know, all kinds of See, things. I'd love, to have, I'd love to have that. What's that sound again, Tom? <laughs> I would yeah. rather, I'd rather have Al Chervik's uh, horn on his golf cart and catch it. <laughs> I can't. I'm not going to try to do it right now, but I would rather have that. So I, I saved that story for when you came in because – I was like, I'm uh, I'm was, sorry for that person. That I, sounds... no, I, they were very nice people, so yeah. I really felt bad for the guy. Yeah. Because we got to talk to him a little bit on the tour. Yeah. But my man tore up the side of that mm. Tesla. Were they uh, like, were they locals? No, they were not. No. Oh, that's even worse. They were not. So they're driving home. Yeah, they're driving home with damaged. no mirror. Everything's tore up on the side, and, and Elon Musk is yelling at them, and it just wasn't pretty. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Was, by the way, that mirror cost more than my entire Pinto. I was going to say, like, what's more expensive, the car or a, a year at American University? I'm not uh, sure. Well, well they can only swing one, and fortunately, that's going to be the car now. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> I guess that guy's going to state tech. Yeah, yeah. It can't be, hey, be at CCBC there's, Essex. There's, there's nothing wrong with County. an associate's degree at community Di college. Directional, not at all. directional state tech. That's right. All right, man, man, you and I. Uh, we realize, got a lot we'll going on. We got Jack Veltry talking transfers. Uh, Derek Scott will join us. A little hoops, a little baseball. And uh, we'll talk more about uh, about what Michi's doing. Got some football. We'll hear from Shane. All right. So. All that's coming up on the postgame show with uh, Jay and Elijah Tyler. Fine job, my friend. Thanks to our buddy Evan Cohen from ESPN Radio. We'll come back in here and do this thing tomorrow at noon.